There's an app for that. Wait, hold on. I'm Steve Jobs. Come on, don't stop it. It was a phrase so ubiquitous in the early days of the smartphone craze that it's hard to believe Apple actually has trademarked. It was a testament to a simple and immutable truth about the world these new touchscreen phones were creating. No matter how strange and obscure the need, there would be an app to fulfill it. Perhaps you remember iBeer, the app that allowed you to pretend you were drinking a tall glass of beer for some reason. There was Car Matey, an app that reminded you where you parked your car in a pirate voice. And who could forget I Am Bread, a surreal game about controlling a sentient slice of bread on a quest to become toast. But there's one app out there somewhere on the market that you probably didn't download. And if you did, well, you have our sincerest apologies. Because even seeing this video pop out onto your feed probably sent a chill down your spine. Well, if that chill ever even left. Take it from one gentleman whose life took a very strange turn after downloading a certain app that the SCP Foundation calls SCP-1471. Because the sentiment, there's an app for that, doesn't exclude experiencing mortal terror. Joe Lillis, an insurance salesman from Milwaukee, had just gone through another atrocious date. After a mediocre meal and an uncomfortable 35 minutes of inane babble, sensing the whole time that she really wasn't that interested, his date excused himself to take a quick phone call outside. Sadly for Joe, she never returned, leaving him to pick up the check. Of all the many words you could use to describe poor Joe Lillis, the most pertinent would be lonely. Ever since Carol, his wife of 10 years, had passed away in a freak accident, he'd been trying to find some kind of way to fill the void. They'd been high school sweethearts, intent on spending the rest of their lives with one another. As fate would have it, only Carol would get that tainted luxury. Joe would be forced to endure life after the joy of living had run its course. He only hoped he might be lucky enough to find love again. However, Joe was on the wrong side of 40, and as so many others his age were already hitched, he could feel his options going out one by one. Would he be destined to live out the rest of his days alone? Joe didn't feel like spending the back half of his life catching reruns of Seinfeld and tending to his fish. He needed to get out there. And thankfully, like the rest of us, he lived in the internet age. He had more apps, websites, online services, and hot Russian singles in his area than he knew what to do with. So surely one would have the right person for him. He tried them all. Tinder, Hinge, Match.com, Plenty of Fish, eHarmony, Bumble, Zeusk, OkCupid, FriendFinder, Deeply Lonely Singles with Low Expectations.com, and so much more. However, all it seemed to achieve was setting him up for more disappointment. None of the dates he'd managed to get ever resulted in anything getting serious. Heck, it was a minor miracle if he even managed to get any of them on a second date. Was this it? Was this his life now? Had he only ever gotten one shot at love, and the grasping claws of fate yanked it away from him without a second thought? Would life continue on the hamster wheel of loneliness? Sleeping, getting up, eating, working, and sleeping again? Every day getting somehow both faster and slower as life trudged on to a disappointing yet inevitable conclusion? What a terrible fate to find yourself trapped in. Whenever Joe started feeling maudlin like this, he knew it was time to get proactive again. Maybe the right woman was out there. There were billions of them, after all. Surely at least one of them would be the perfect person for him. He just needed the perfect app. He'd burned through all of the most reputable apps already, and was now perusing some of the slightlier, seedier options, most of which were likely data mining fronts from the Vulcans. However, as generic app after generic app passed, something different caught his eye. The icon was a smiling cartoon dog, and its name was Mallow, version 1.0.0. This gave him a little chuckle. At the very least, it was very different branding from the rest of the dating apps he'd seen. Maybe it'd just been sorted into the wrong section of the app store. He decided he'd check it out and take a look at the app's description. The description read, Never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mallow is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but after just a few hours of Mallow, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, 
The more you participate, the more Malau will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy. Well, it certainly provoked Joe's curiosity at the very least. He did want to banish his feelings of loneliness, and seeing as the app was free and apparently had no ads, he'd surely be foolish to not at least give it a whirl. What's the worst that could happen? He began the installation, and only then noticed that the app had no listed developer. It took up 9.8 megabytes of memory, which he wasn't tech-savvy enough to see any issues with. More than anything, Joe was just enticed by the prospect of finally having another chance at companionship with Mallow. After all, it is the next social substitute, whatever that means. However, Joe's excitement was quickly quashed when he hit the home screen button, and noticed that the icon for the app never actually materialized. Strange. He checked the App Store portal again and saw that, according to them, the app had completely downloaded. What gives? Was it a glitch, or was Mallow actually just malware? Either way, he was disheartened by the fact that this immaterial app certainly wouldn't be getting him any companionship. Or so he thought, anyway. Joe was used to disappointment by now, so he didn't take it too personally. He decided to just play out the rest of his evening on autopilot, making himself some soup, doing the laundry, watching more Seinfeld reruns, taking a cold shower, and preparing to cry himself to sleep again. Mallow was already becoming a distant memory, just like all the deceptive sources of hope. But one strange thing happened that disrupted Joe's finely tuned evening routine. He received a text message. This was incredibly strange, because nobody ever seemed to text him. The last text he got was from Carol just before her accident, so it was almost surreal to hear that alert sound now, after everything that happened. He checked and saw that the text was an image attachment sent from an unknown number. Perplexed yet curious, he decided to open it. His curiosity soon gave way to a kind of melancholy nostalgia when he saw that the photo was of his and Carol's favorite cafe in town. They'd spent many a morning there, back when she was alive, treating themselves to a nice cup of coffee and perhaps a croissant. Just seeing it again caused an involuntary smile to spread across his face. It never even occurred to him, as it probably would have to others, that this could be seen as a little creepy. He hadn't frequented the bakery since Carol died. How would anyone even know that this place held any significance for him? Was it a stalker, a ghost, or just a spooky coincidence? None of these thoughts even crossed Joe's mind. He was just grateful for the surprising reminder of the happiness he'd once had. For the next couple hours, things seemed lighter. He went about his evening, checking the photo every so often and smiling, until eventually he found himself in bed, still looking into the glow of his phone. It was such a beautiful little cafe. Then he froze. He noticed something in the picture. It'd been there the whole time, but only now he was seeing rather than just looking. It was in the corner, staring through the glass of the cafe's door. So faint, he almost wanted to dismiss it as a trick of the light. It was a face. Well, not a face, more like a skull. Not a human, not anywhere near human. Long, slender, and canine, with protruding fangs and vacant white eyes. The pure white of the skull was buried in a nest of thick black hair. It looked like it was crouching behind the door, looking out and grinning, whatever the hell it was. Just seeing it changed the entire tone of the picture. It was no longer a simple reminder of bygone joy. Now, all that was radiating out of that image was a palpable sense of dread. Was someone playing some kind of awful prank on him? Just then, he was jogged from his contemplation by another alert. A new message from the same number as before. With great hesitation, he hovered his thumb over the push notification and clicked. That's when everything got a lot worse. It was a photo of a bus stop. Not just any bus stop, of course. It was stop C16 the one that Joe always took to get to work. It looked like it was taken relatively early in the morning, but nobody was there. Well, not quite nobody. There was that figure again. It stood at full height, behind the partially frosted glass that makes up the back of the bus stop. The same large black humanoid shape, with a white grinning dog skull where the face should be. Something about it terrified him on such a primal level, like the way our lizard brain reacts to some ancient apex predator. And whatever this thing was, it clearly knew something about him. 
How else could it stage all these photos? Joe got out of bed and looked out of the window, down onto his dark front street. Empty, thankfully. But after this surprise nightmare, he wasn't going to take any chances. He grabbed a kitchen knife from downstairs and placed it on his bedside cabinet, right next to his phone, with 911 on speed dial. Joe Lillis, a 43-year-old man, slept with the lights on that night for the first time in over 30 years. Sadly for him, the nightmare was just beginning. The next morning, Joe woke up unharmed, but he wasn't pleased to see that he'd gotten several more texts in his sleep. There was one taken outside of the local insurance company office where he worked. The strange creature with the skull for a face was looming around the corner, peering at the camera with its lipless grin, like it was mocking him. Another photo was taken at the local supermarket where Joe did most of his grocery shopping. The frame was centralized on the cereal aisle, bordered on both sides by walls of garish mascots endlessly repeated. Down at the far end of the aisle was a looming dark figure with that cold canine skull where a human face should be. There were a few more, but worst of all was the last one. It was taken at the cemetery, in the foreground a headstone reading, Carol Lillis, beloved wife and daughter. Joe was horrified to see that skull-faced beast was rising up behind his wife's grave, long clawed fingers curling around the top of the headstone. That was the moment that Joe decided to go to the police about all of this, before things got even more out of hand. He called an Uber to get down to the station. He certainly didn't feel like he was going anywhere near his regular bus stop after last night. He showed the photos he'd been sent so far to an officer posted at the station, and they agreed that there was certainly something strange about it. While the behavior undeniably bordered on harassment, it hadn't yet delved into criminal territory, so he would sadly be on his own until then. The best they could do was stay in touch and kept abreast of any new developments. The only sage advice they could give him was not to delete the photos, as they could always be used as evidence in court later if things escalated. This was literally the last result that Joe wanted out of this. Considering how bizarre and threatening things were getting already, he really didn't want to find out what escalation looked like in this case. But what else could he do but carry on, just trying to exercise as much caution as he could in these strange new circumstances? He went to work and tried his best to stay productive, despite the fact that every three or so hours, a new photo would arrive. Places that he liked to sit in the local parks, stores he'd frequent, restaurants he liked to eat at. The nightmare skeleton dog thing would be standing in all of them, just mugging for the camera. On one hand, every time he looked at one of the photos, Joe felt like he was giving this freak exactly what they wanted. On the other hand, how could he possibly look away? What if he missed something that could save his life? It carried on much like that until later in the evening. Joe may have not been a genius, but he was no fool either. He'd seen too many of those seedy true crime documentaries about kidnapping to take his normal route home. He took a real detour, frequently checking over his shoulder the entire time. Much to his relief, he didn't see anything out of place. Good. When he got home, he locked every door and bolted every window. Nothing would be getting the jump on him tonight. That's when the next picture came in. A photograph of Joe's empty office cubicle, with the bony face of the creature looming over the divider with a grin. He could feel his heart pounding away in his chest just looking at it. How did this thing get around like this? How was it able to infiltrate everywhere in his entire goddamn life? Suddenly, he felt a smile spreading across his face. This freak had just messed up big time. Before all these creepy photos had been taken in public places, but the one taken in his office? Oh, this crossed the line into trespassing. The police would have to do something about it now. It had given him an ace up his sleeve. That confidence faded a few hours later when he received another photo. This time, it was the skull-faced monster just standing on the sidewalk. The sidewalk that Joe remembered walking on his covert alternative route. He could feel himself break into a cold sweat. It seemed, whoever this was, he really did hold no secrets from them. Now more than ever, Joe didn't feel safe in his own home. So you can only imagine how he felt when a few hours later, he received a photo of the skull-faced stalker standing right outside his own front door, staring into the camera. It sent him rushing to the window again to check outside, but of course, 
nobody was there. The next day, when he called the police and updated them on the situation, they told him that they were doing all they could. The best thing he could possibly do was to remain calm, but vigilant. He needed to keep an eye on the photos being sent to him, so he could notify them if ever he was in any immediate danger. This put poor Joe's paranoia at a fever pitch. Even when he went to work, surrounded by his co-workers, by witnesses, he could scarcely tear his eyes away from his phone. He was a slave to the photos, forever waiting for the next one, only to experience crushing regret when the photo actually arrived. It looked like it was taken moments before it was sent to him. Joe saw himself looking at his own phone in his office cubicle, with that huge skull-faced figure looming behind him. He screamed out loud upon seeing it, and turned to see if anything was behind him. But of course, there was nothing there. The police inspected the office, talked to potential witnesses, and analyzed the photo. It showed no signs of any photographic manipulation, but there were also no witnesses around the office who claimed to see anything strange that day. There was also no security camera footage in the last several days that showed this figure coming in or out. Joe Lillis started to feel like he was going insane, and perhaps he was. But that didn't change the tangible and ever-present feeling that he was in great danger. He didn't come into work the next day. He'd received more photos like that in the night, of himself, taken in real time, with that skull face freak looming. He didn't want to leave the house. He didn't want to go anywhere anymore. He just didn't feel safe out there. How could he, with all this madness unfolding? There was a time where he could have said something like, at least it only seems confined to my phone. He might have even suspected that it had something to do with that strange Malow app he downloaded a few days prior that hadn't seemed to do anything. But this situation had evolved since then. He wasn't just seeing the creature in photos anymore. It was here. He kept seeing quick flashes of it on the other side of windows, in reflections, in the corner of his eyes, always darting away if ever he turned towards it. It was everywhere and nowhere. It was here just for him. He just knew. The police couldn't help. Nobody could help. Joe just sat in the corner of his bedroom, clutching his kitchen knife, afraid to close his eyes. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. We know one thing for sure. Joe Lillis never felt truly alone ever again. He always had his new friend waiting just out of sight. And if ever you're feeling lonesome and decide to download Malow version 1.0.0 yourself, then you'll never feel lonely again either. It was November 3rd, 1991, and Blake Newsom loved his job. He had a passion for organization, an undying love of American political history, and was a lifelong member of the Republican Party. That's why he took great pride in his position as a filing clerk at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. Or at least he did, until his horrifying encounter with SCP-1981. The worst day of Blake's life began like any other. He was taking inventory of the archive's wide array of Betamax tapes, and making sure that they were all arranged carefully and conformed with the filing system. One by one, he checked footage of speeches and addresses off of his list, until he came upon a strange tape that had no business being there. The tape looked to be completely normal, but it hadn't been recorded on the archive inventory. And there was something else off about it. A single white sticker was on the front of the tape with Ronald Reagan cut up while talking, scrawled hastily with what was probably a felt tip marker. Blake was shocked and appalled. They hadn't even spelled the president's name correctly. What poor Mr. Newsom didn't know was that he was about to see something so disturbing that he'd look back on that misspelling like it was a treasured childhood memory. Standard policy for tapes like this would be to review and catalog, or even throw it out if necessary. Typically, a lowly filing clerk like Blake would need to seek approval from his superiors, but curiosity got the better of him. He commandeered one of the library's televisions and Betamax cassette players and started watching the footage. For the first minute or so, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Just the president standing at the podium giving his iconic Evil Empire speech to the National Association of Evangelicals at Sheraton Twin Towers Hotel, Orlando, Florida, on March 8, 1983. However, the second the tape hit the 1 minute and 10 seconds mark, something unnatural began to occur. President Reagan's speech began to veer off as the topic of conversation shifted from the importance of family values 
to the exquisite taste of human flesh. Blake was taken aback. Surely he was hearing things. But the tape only got worse. President Reagan began to divulge the fact that he enjoyed the taste of young flesh the best, particularly that of infants. As Reagan began to go into detail about how exactly one should best cook an infant if you want to seal in the flavor, the crowd erupted into modest applause. Blake started to feel sick. He'd remembered watching this speech, and President Reagan had said nothing of the sort. Things only got weirder as the president's cheeks suddenly opened up into a long, bleeding gash, as though someone had cut into his face with an invisible knife. As the speech continued, and Reagan's words became more nonsensical and incoherent, the injuries got worse, too. His face developed puncture wounds, like he was being stabbed. Skin in some areas rotted and peeled off. Reagan showed no awareness of the horrifying injuries that seemed to be occurring spontaneously on his body. This was a living nightmare. The tape came to a merciful end 22 minutes in, after President Reagan's throat appeared to be slashed open and his insane speech was reduced to quiet gurgles. It fizzled out into static shortly after, and Blake politely retired to the bathroom to throw up. Was this some sick prank or tampering or camera trickery, perhaps? He didn't know, but the tape was disgusting, and whoever was responsible had to be punished. Newsom contacted the police, hoping obscenity charges could be pressed against the creator of the tape once they were found. The tape was taken into evidence, and a low-level police investigation into the possible culprits began. While the police officers who viewed the tape reported nightmares in the weeks following, the creator of the tape was never found. The investigation truly came to an end when a superior closed the case and the tape disappeared from the evidence locker. This, as you probably could have guessed, was the work of a field agent from the SCP Foundation. Anesthetics were then used to erase the memories of everyone unlucky enough to witness the tape, including Blake Newsom, who could finally rest easy and return to his filing work. The anomalous tape was now in responsible hands. It was given the designation SCP-1981 and given the object class safe due to its easily controlled and self-contained nature. Proper research and testing was now able to begin, and while nothing about the construction of the tape suggested anything inherently anomalous, repeat viewings of the video made it clear that this went far beyond mere doctored footage of a presidential speech. Every single time the tape is played, both the speech made and the injuries received by President Reagan change. The few rules the tape seemed to always follow are that Reagan never reacts to the injuries he's receiving, it always has the same beginning and total runtime, and the speech is always corrupted. The speeches have been described as mostly incoherent, lacking any sort of underlying thematic structure, and largely being composed of nonsensical anecdotes and parables. So not that dissimilar from a regular Reagan speech, but the topics always turn incredibly dark, and have included torture, mutilation, death, cannibalism, ritual sacrifice, genocide, and more. The range of injuries shown on President Reagan in the videos have included, but are by no means limited to, impalement, mutilation, and some tortures so gruesome that the details have been redacted from official files. On several occasions, the details of President Reagan's speech have also eerily predicted the future. These include successfully predicting the September 11th attacks in 2001 and the outcome of the 2008 Russian presidential election. Incidentally, this isn't even the only Reagan-related SCP to predict the future. No, there's another entity in this incredibly specific niche, SCP-095, a highly degraded copy of a comic known as The Atomic Adventures of Ronnie Reagan. The title character bears a striking resemblance to President Reagan, despite the fact that the comet is confirmed by Foundation tests to have been written in the early 1930s. The comic is set in the far-off future world of the 1980s and follows a number of Ronnie's exploits in three stories. The first, titled Ronnie vs. Space Admiral Carter, seems to perfectly describe the events of the 1980 presidential election. The second, Space Assassin, mirrors the attempted assassination of President Reagan by John Hinckley Jr. And the third, titled Jungle Planet, retells the Iran-Contra controversies of 1986. These comics were produced under the mysterious and apparently non-existent company, Future Funnies. The Foundation hopes to track down the other comics from this company whenever possible, but they've had no luck on that front. For now, there's only SCP-095. 
During initial testing, Foundation staff watched the tape frequently in case mm -hmm. this strange, corrupted version of President Reagan had any other valuable predictions for the future. However, during one of these screenings, one of the D-Class observation personnel pointed and yelled at the screen in horror. Upon further examination of recorded footage, researchers could see exactly what had concerned the D-Class observer so much. While in other viewings of the tape, President Reagan's press detail had appeared totally normal, in this one something was clearly amiss. Standing among the other dull, suit-wearing political aides was a tall figure dressed in a midnight black cloak with a large conical hood obscuring his face. The figure didn't appear to move in the footage, it just stood there, menacingly. A later survey indicated that this figure would appear in roughly one in seven viewings of the tape. This cloaked figure was designated SCP-1981-1, and he became part of the reoccurring imagery in the nightmares that often followed a viewing of SCP-1981. Naturally, despite containment and preservation attempts, the Foundation was aware that just like any normal tape, natural magnetic interference would eventually degrade it beyond use. Attempts to copy the footage onto another Betamax tape failed to reproduce the anomalous effects. That's why the Foundation has painstakingly recorded any video and audio they could via a standard commercial camcorder. In one particularly terrifying playback, SCP-1981-1 took the President's place at the podium, staring directly into the camera. The words, I see you, appeared over a black screen shortly after. Staff members were ordered never to make an attempt at communicating with the figure, and instead contact a Level 4 superior if such an event occurs during a playback again. The frightening and unfortunate effects of SCP-1981 would come to their logical conclusion under the watchful eye of Dr. James Kyle Robinson, managing archivist of inert safe class objects and anomalous items at Site-73. He was contacted by Special Agent Arnold Rodriguez and Special Agent Ethan Tate, members of the Secret Service with a duty to protect President Reagan. Word had gotten to Reagan that there was an anomalous artifact in the possession of the Foundation that directly pertained to him, and he wanted to see it. Dr. Robinson obtained files and transcripts pertaining to SCP-1981 and handed them over to the agents, but refused to allow President Reagan to see the tape directly without approval from O5 Command. Mm -hmm. But Reagan and the agents were persistent. Eventually, O5 Command ordered a private screening of the tape for President Reagan at the Sanford Chemical Processing Plant, a front business owned and operated by the Foundation for Amnestic Production. Dr. Robinson offered President Reagan the use of amnestics after the session completed, but Reagan declined. The screening took place in Conference Room B, and the tape was replayed three times. It was on the third playback that things took an interesting turn. As the mutilated Reagan on the screen began to rant about drinking the blood of a child from the skull of Vladimir Putin, Reagan began to silently mouth along the words as though he remembered them. He spoke about beings known as the Destroyers and potential apocalyptic events to come. After the screening, Reagan once again refused the offer of amnestics and departed. It seemed as though all was well, until a violent break-in at the Sanford Chemical Processing Plant that left a night guard dead. A large number of amnestics had been stolen during the break-in, and security footage showed that Agent Tate and Rodriguez had been responsible. The two agents were tracked down and traced to the residence of Ronald Reagan, where the Foundation came upon a disturbing sight. The agents had pillaged large quantities of Class A and B amnestics and supplied them to President Reagan, who, at some point after observing SCP-1981, had been driven into a dangerous madness. The two agents wanted to cure him before he caused harm to himself or others, but their bungling had come with severe consequences. Misapplying such a high quantity of amnestics had essentially destroyed Reagan's mind, and while the Foundation was able to stabilize his condition, his impaired memory and cognitive function would leave him unable to care for himself independently. In order to cover up for this grievous mistake, a cover story was concocted about Reagan falling victim to Alzheimer's and facing severe cognitive decline as a result. Both agents Tate and Rodriguez were fired for their actions, had their memories wiped by the Foundation, and were assigned new identities. Dr. Robinson, for his part in the disaster, had to face a Foundation Ethics Committee disciplinary hearing. While SCP-1981 continues to be classified as safe due to its unlikeliness to ever breach containment, when you consider the havoc it wrought on the mind of its singular target, safe is hardly the word that comes to mind. It's enough to make you wonder what other tapes are lurking out there just waiting to be found. It all started with a panicked phone call. 
A local landlady who owned a downtown tenement building had called the police in hysterics. Something horrifying had happened to one of her tenants. She couldn't possibly explain. The one detail she was able to articulate was that his room looked like a rainforest. A police response team was on the case in no time. They drove down to the tenement building, met the crying landlady at the door, and found their way to the room that caused all this confusion. When they'd opened the door, they saw with horror that she was right. Trees, plants, fungi, and even insects and animals were all over the room. It was teeming with life. The flora and fauna in this room didn't look like anything else on Earth, and given the anomalous nature of what had happened here, it's extremely possible they were right. The tenant, a university professor who'd recently gone on an anthropological expedition to the Amazon rainforest, was nowhere to be seen, but one of the officers spotted a grim clue for what may have happened to him. A large colony of anomalous mold was quickly growing on the far wall. The officer swore it was a trick of the mind at first, but he was wrong. A human skull was sinking into the tissue of the mold, and to make matters worse, whipping tendrils began to slither from the empty eye sockets, reaching for the new meat. Thankfully for everyone who was still alive at this point, the SCP Foundation swooped in and took over the situation with the help of a mobile task force and some containment specialists. The landlady, the cops, and the other residents of the building were given amnestics and relocated. The building was purchased by the Foundation and condemned while they searched the anomalous room for the source of this unchecked biological growth and they found their answer in a most unlikely form, an unmarked cassette tape still inside the player when they arrived. The recording on this cassette tape came to be known as SCP-407. It may be unassuming when compared to immortal, misanthropic lizard monsters and multi-dimensional chaos gods, but the tape in that room, if it ever fell into the wrong hands, could cause a mass ecological catastrophe that would inevitably bloom into a dreaded XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. So first things first, what is actually on this tape? Thanks to brief samples heard in tests with D-Class personnel, the Foundation was able to discover that it was an approximately 28-minute long recording of a song. It's performed in an unknown language, and appears to be sung a cappella style by a group of unknown individuals. Fearing potential degradation of the cassette tape, the Foundation backed it up as an audio file in the Site-19 computer database. Those who've been able to listen to the song during testing have had an overwhelmingly positive emotional response, describing it as soothing, glorious, and beautiful. And for the first minute of its runtime, the song's anomalous effect really live up to this reputation. When the song is played, it massively accelerates cell growth within its auditory range. Its potency is increased by the volume and the length it's allowed to play. It's important to note that plugging or covering your ears won't make any difference. The area of effect seems to be defined by how far the sound vibrations travel, and whether you're actually able to hear it is irrelevant. But if you're only listening for a minute or less, you'll be glad to feel the anomalous effect of being within SCP-407's auditory range. During this specific period of time, it's been shown to be a kind of miracle cure to almost all physical maladies, with the exception of cancer. Thanks to the cell-growing and rejuvenating properties of the song, the Foundation discovered that 407 was an effective treatment for Alzheimer's disease, Crohn's disease, brain and spinal cord injuries, and normally fatal infections or wounds, amongst other maladies. It was like a version of SCP-500, the pills that can cure everything, but one that would never run out. So, if it's such an effective healer, why wasn't it more widely employed by the Foundation? Because of what happens if you keep listening. If the song was played for two to three minutes, the subject would begin to experience unnecessary and unchecked cell growth particularly on the skin. The result would mostly be benign tumors and calcium and fat deposits, which though sometimes painful and disfiguring, are not life-threatening. At minute four, single-celled organisms in the auditory vicinity of the song begin to experience accelerated mitosis, also known as cell division. This results in bacterial and fungal growth that become extremely dangerous for anyone and anything exposed. And beyond minute five, things become truly monstrous. 
The foundation only ever conducted two tests wherein the song was fully played. These tests presented such a huge danger that further testing of 407 was forbidden without explicit permission from a member of O5 Command. The first test involved a female member of D-Class personnel in a soundproofed but unsterilized testing chamber. As expected, she was initially delighted by the music. It cured her injured knee and brought her back to a state of peak physical fitness, but this didn't last for long. She soon began to report intense dizziness and stomach pain, resulting in severe sickness. At this point, anomalous plant growth began in the corners of the testing chamber. It seemed as though a whole ecosystem was coming to life and evolving at an impossibly fast rate in the chamber. Over the next few minutes, the D-Class experienced a nightmarish physical transformation. Her skin became a thick, calloused mass. She soon devolved further into a thick, immobile blob of pure flesh, unrecognizable as anything human, while the chamber around her was becoming a lush rainforest of alien plants. These plants grew around and eventually on her, until there was nothing left. Shortly after, all the plants died and decomposed, giving away to a huge mound of anomalous mold devouring the resulting mulch. The mold itself began to evolve, growing large mouth and hand-like structures that it used to feed itself on the surrounding flora and fauna as it began to grow back. When the song ended, the Foundation brought the test to a close, sterilized the room and collected some samples for later. There was nothing left of the original D-Class subject. The second test wasn't any nicer. While at first the subject, this time a male member of D-Class personnel, appeared to become more youthful and even gain an inch of height, as the minutes passed, he began to experience extreme discomfort. He soon began to vomit, with the vomit quickly blooming into plants. Plant shoots also began to quickly spring out of his eyes and mouth, until his entire body was destroyed by what appeared to be a banana tree suddenly growing out of it. Once again, the testing chamber became a whole ecosystem. This one filled with unique, never-before-seen mammals. However, it all came to an end when the room was taken over by a fast-growing parasitic fungus that consumed everything else with its spores and fungal stalks. And it looked like it was breathing. There was something concerning about both of these tests, beyond the obvious physical horror of watching death by unchecked cell growth. What was this mysterious fungus that kept appearing and seemed to take over everything it touched in the end? The Foundation tested the samples it collected rigorously, and it came to a surprising conclusion. They'd actually encountered this same fungus before, but not in this dimension. SCP-507 is a man with dimension-hopping abilities. The one problem is, he can't control where and when he hops. As a result, he's been stuck in a number of scary alternate dimensions, but one seemed eerily similar to what the Foundation was encountering with SCP-407. In one dimension he briefly hopped into, 507 encountered an abandoned version of Site-19, strewn with corpses covered in that same breathing mold. He was horrified, but decided to inspect further hoping to find his way out of the facility and discover some answers about what happened here. However, when he found his way out, what he discovered didn't comfort him. The entire world seemed to be covered by this same mold. There was nothing left. It consumed everything. Thanks to Foundation tests, both molds were found to be similar to the Cordyceps fungi, a kind of dangerous parasitic mold. Except this one appeared to be a far more evolved and even more deadly version of the fungus. What could this mean? What was the origin of this anomalous song? Would it and the fungus it seems to inspire someday destroy the world as we know it and kill us all? We'll never actually know the answer to any of this. And it's thanks to an extremely unlikely ally. A person of interest nicknamed L.S a prominent member of the Serpent's Hand. This enigmatic figure had previously come into possession of SCP-268, a hat that made them almost impossible to detect. With the help of this hat, LS breached Site-19 in an incident that was later dubbed Security Breach Incident X-23. While it's believed that LS mainly broke into the facility to make use of SCP-914, they performed a curious action along the way. They hacked into the Foundation database and deleted all traces of SCP-407, effectively neutralizing it. In a note left by LS, they said, You'll thank me for deleting what you call 407. 
Why would a member of the Serpent's Hand, a group of interests that is often militant in their anti-neutralization stance, neutralize an SCP themselves? The answer to this lays in who exactly LS is. This mysterious figure isn't technically one person, they're a group of the same person, namely a woman named Allison Chow, from a number of different dimensions. They meet in the Wanderer's Library, the headquarters of the Serpent's Hand that exists between dimensions to coordinate their missions. Why does this matter in regards to SCP-407? Because the nature of LS allows them to know what's going on in a huge number of dimensions at once. This means, much like the brief glimpse given by SCP-507, LS likely knows about another universe where 407 and its horrific mold have already caused an XK-class scenario and destroyed the world. And if it happened there due to poor biological containment measures, or 407 falling into the wrong hands, it could happen here too. Unless, of course, someone stepped in and dealt with the problem personally. And while the Foundation's policy is typically to contain rather than neutralize the anomalies they find, we have to admit, we're probably with the serpent's hand on this one. Some songs, as it turns out, are just better left unplayed. You're sitting in the middle of a cheering crowd. The arena around you is electric, fans hollering from their seats as they watch the basketball game. Every point scored, every shot missed, and every skillful pass of the ball sends waves of excitement over everyone in the audience. Applause, shouts, and chants fill the air. It distracts you for a moment. You find yourself swept up in the energy of the game. But slowly, surely, a nagging feeling creeps up on you as your eyes follow the ball. That feeling turns to a sickening realization as one of the players jumps and dunks the basketball, scoring another two points. You notice the look on his face, the same look on the faces of all the other players on the court, a solemn, hopeless expression. It's the same look of silent despair worn by all the spectators around you. Then you remember, You've watched this exact game of basketball before, many, many times before. And that is when you feel the same hopeless expression appear on your own face, realizing just how long you have been here, watching this game over and over, reminded that you will never, ever leave this arena. Welcome to SCP-1733. To the untrained eye, SCP-1733 seems to be a completely harmless item. Stored in a digital video recorder, it is kept securely in the dusty depths of the SCP Foundation's video archives. If any researcher is given permission to study SCP-1733, they will find it to be an ordinary VHS tape. But what about the contents of said tape? Does it contain a bizarre, disconnected series of black and white video clips that when viewed only give the watcher seven days before the spirit of a drowned girl comes crawling out of their TV screen to kill them? Well, not exactly. But we're sure that if such a tape exists, the Foundation probably has it under lock and key, too. The footage on SCP-1733 is as seemingly banal as the ordinary VHS tape itself. When played, the viewer will witness a TV broadcast of a basketball game, specifically the 2010-2011 NBA season opener, broadcast on television and captured on tape by an unknown civilian. The game took place on the 26th of October 2010 in the TD Garden Arena in Boston, Massachusetts, a game where the hometown Boston Celtics took on the Miami Heat. By now, perhaps you are wondering what is so special about this particular game, and why the SCP Foundation would be so interested in keeping a VHS recording of it so secure. Is one of the O5 Council secretly a Celtics fan? Well, that's impossible to say for sure. What we do know for certain is that SCP-1733 is far more than just a harmless recording of a basketball game. The SCP Foundation first caught wind of SCP-1733's existence the day after the game. On October 27, a Boston native that had watched and recorded the game made comments on social media about a technical foul that the game's referee had failed to pick up on. According to this individual, during the third quarter, an instance of unsportsmanlike conduct took place between Ray Allen and Chris Bosch. The person making these claims was quickly ridiculed by commenters on the same thread, but then this person uploaded a clip of this foul from the footage they had recorded. 
the other commenters were dumbfounded. During the original broadcast, that foul had never happened, but the recording showed it clearer as day. The footage was quickly expunged and all traces of the clip removed from the internet by personnel acting on behalf of the SCP Foundation. Any that had viewed the video on Facebook or been a part of the comments debating this previously non-existent foul were tracked down via their IP addresses. All of them, including the owner of the tape, were given amnestics to wipe their memories of the supposed infraction, and SCP-1733 was returned to the Foundation for further analysis. Researchers at the Foundation were determined to understand the anomalous nature of SCP-1733 and why the footage contained on this particular VHS tape was so different from the basketball game's original broadcast. At first, the differences in the game seemed to be only slight changes from the one that actually aired on TV. A different foul here, a small point difference there. While the recording of the game contained on SCP-1733 was slightly different from the real-life game, perhaps even more interesting was that these differences changed with repeat viewings. Researchers wouldn't observe the same differences every time they watched SCP-1733, but would instead spot something different that had been changed each time they restarted the tape. And as they continued to watch and rewatch SCP-1733's footage, the true horror of the video's anomalous properties became more and more apparent. As the footage recorded on SCP-1733 began to diverge more and more from the original broadcast, researchers shifted their attention away from the basketball game itself and onto the people watching it. Just like the specifics of the game itself, the fans in the arena seemed to also change with every rewatch of the tape. And even stranger, the people in the crowd seemed to not only be aware of their existence within the footage, but also retain memories of every previous replayed vision. Each time the researchers had watched SCP-1733, the audience trapped within had gained more and more cognizance. Every man, woman, and child in the audience of that basketball game began remembering that they had seen multiple variations of the same game over and over again. This first became apparent to Foundation researchers when the game's commentators, two presenters named Mike and Tommy, began to comment on a strange sense of deja vu they were experiencing as they watched the Boston Celtics and Miami Heat play. Both seemed to share notions that the game they were witnessing was strangely familiar, and in later replays of the tape, these two commentator personalities were able to recall the events of the game with perfect, vivid accuracy. While they never addressed the viewer directly, this cumulative effect seems to have extended to every person that was present within the arena at the time that the original broadcast was recorded. Everyone, from the commentators to the coaches, the players to the patrons, all remember the diverging versions of the basketball game, but seem to have no awareness that they are trapped inside a recording on a VHS tape. It should be noted that it is still unclear whether the entities are real people or digital copies that solely reside on the tape. Every individual shown to be inside TD Garden on the 26th of October 2010 seems to be identical to their counterparts in the real world. Each of the basketball players on both the Boston Celtics and Miami Heat teams have the exact same level of talent as they do in reality and their individual mannerisms are perfectly recreated in the SCP-1733 footage. And the same is true of the fans in the audience, each one appearing to be, in every conceivable way, a living human being. But the most unnerving aspect of SCP-1733 was found when the Foundation agents were tasked with tracking down members of the audience who were seen on the tape, and they found nothing. Unlike the players and coaches who can quite easily be found in our world, with many of them still playing or involved with professional basketball, personnel were unable to find a single trace of any of the people from the audience, not one clue as to their current whereabouts or status. It is unclear how, but it appears that everyone shown on SCP-1733, especially those watching the game unfold from the stands, is a person trapped in digital form stuck watching variations of the same match on loop. Researchers at the SCP Foundation who were studying SCP-1733 initially theorized that the tape had been designed to display an infinite variety of different game outcomes. Given that the tactics utilized by the players were different with each playback of SCP-1733, this seemed to be the case. 
that the tape was showing a what-if scenario each time the tape was rewound and played from the start. But the scenario wasn't resetting each time. It was clear that they were learning. By the 34th replay of the footage, the Boston Celtics and Miami Heat were so in tune with the opposing team's playbook that both sides' players were able to perfectly and precisely counter their opponent's moves and kept the score at 0-0 for much of the game. At this stage in the Foundation's research, the players on the SCP-1733 tape had not yet become fully aware that they had played the same game already in earlier playbacks. But it is possible that weak memories of the earlier versions of the same match manifested as instinctive ways players could counter the moves of their rival team. However, by the time Foundation researchers had replayed the SCP-1733 footage 45 times, the players, their coaches, and fans watching the game had become aware of what was happening to them. It was at this point that the digital recording from TD Garden changed dramatically. Realizing that they'd been playing the same game of basketball over and over, the players refused to participate any longer. Everyone in the audience began to attempt to escape from the tape where they'd been unknowingly imprisoned. But not a single one of the stadium's doors would budge, and neither the fans nor the players seemed to be able to leave through any other exit out of TD Garden. Over the following playbacks of the SCP-1733 videotape, attempts at escape grew increasingly daring. In one playback, a full-scale riot broke out. In another, makeshift explosives were built and used by those trapped to try and blast their way to freedom. As their cognition grew and they began to remember friends and family from outside the videotape, the crowd trapped in SCP-1733 grew even more desperate. Players and their coaches retired to locker rooms, withdrawing from the crowd for a time. The rest of the people in the footage began to form factions amongst themselves, one of the more prominent calling themselves the Faith Keepers. These individuals voiced their belief that they had been confined to TD Garden as some form of spiritual punishment as a result of the consumerism that is rife in a post-industrial society. The Faith Keepers began burning offerings in the center of the basketball court. Phones, wallets, car keys, anything that reminded them of the modern world. Over the subsequent playbacks of SCP-1733, the Faith Keepers grew in their numbers, indoctrinating more of the crowd into their movement. Those still trying to escape from the stadium were causing more damage to themselves than their enclosure, with three men caught in the blast of another crude bomb placed on an exit door. Unfortunately for them, the door barely showed a scratch in the aftermath of the detonation. As Foundation researchers continued replaying the tape, those trapped within SCP-1733 descended into depraved acts, and incidences of violence became rampant. Some even attempted to take their own lives in acts of desperation, jumping from balconies in the hopes of ending the loop. Those that had joined the growing ranks of the Faith Keepers did not engage in such behavior, instead creating makeshift curtains to separate themselves from the breakdown that was taking place among the others trapped within the SCP-1733 tape. At some point beyond the 112th playback of the videotape, the Faith Keepers marched off screen and brought the basketball teams back out onto the main court. They then began a ritualistic sacrifice, disemboweling the professional athletes for their fellow prisoners to see. This had no noticeable effect, with the recording of the game resetting as it had done in earlier rewatches. In a later playback, the Faith Keepers then began to call for all the children in the stadium to be sacrificed in the same way. Testing on SCP-1733 was finally suspended indefinitely after this point, and as far as we know, the crowd remains trapped inside the anomalous recording of this particular Celtics Heat basketball game. Foundation researchers have been unable to produce the same anomalous effects as those of SCP-1733, even when using the DVR that originally produced the recording. The digital video recorder itself does not seem to imprint the same properties onto other VHS tapes, making SCP-1733 an isolated anomaly. However, the next time you find yourself in a basketball game, it might be worth asking yourself, have I seen this game before? Do you like scary movies? If you're a fan of horror, there have probably been quite a few times where you found yourself yelling at the movie screen, don't go up to the attic, don't split up, don't check out the noise in the basement, run out the front door. You know the characters can't hear you, but when the story is engaging enough to make you care about their well-being, 
you can't help but try and give them a hand. After all, you'd want someone to save you from a machete-wielding maniac stalking through a summer camp you took up your new counselor job at. If someone was watching you hide in the closet, listening for a masked killer's footsteps with a kitchen knife in your hand, you'd want them to give you a heads up when the killer was getting ready to chop through the door with an axe. Of course, the characters in your favorite movies never listen, because, you know, that's how movies work. But in 1985, a young man returned a VHS tape entitled Return of the Suburb Slasher to his local video store with a peculiar complaint. The main character of the movie stopped mid-action to look at the camera and beg for his help. The video store clerk laughed him off and refused to give him a refund, though he did eventually give in and offer store credit after the man began to cry. He decided to take the tape home and watch it, just to see what all the fuss was about. After all, he'd never seen someone cry at a horror movie like that. So he sat down on his favorite beanbag chair, pushed the tape into the VCR, and pressed play. Apparently, his shell-shocked customer had at least remembered to be kind and rewind. The movie told the story of Heather Campbell, a young woman planning to host a party at her family's home in a classic suburban cul-de-sac while her parents were out of town. In equally classic slasher fashion, this party would take place on the 10th anniversary of a series of grisly murders in the same neighborhood, committed by the mysterious suburb slasher. As the party kicks off with loud music, teenage debauchery, and lots of drinking out of red plastic cups, the killer appears to pick off the group of friends one by one. Like other classic slasher victims, your Michaels and your Jasons, the suburb slasher also covers their face, wearing a black burlap sack over their head that masks all identifiable features. The first 90 minutes of the movie were fun but basic. A canoodling couple gets decapitated here, an unnecessary shower scene is cut short by a stabbing there, the sort of thing you'd expect. But at about 97 minutes in, something impossible happened. Heather walked into the living room, finding her friend's dead body strewn across it, and let out a scream that measured up to the bests in the genre. The teen scream queen then began to run as the killer appeared to chase her. She made her way into the basement of the house, locked the door behind her, then she turned to the camera, tears in her eyes, shirt spattered with blood and said, Hey mister, I don't know you, and I don't know why you've just sat there watching this without doing nothing, but please, I'm begging you, help me out here, what can I do to survive this? At first the clerk thought he was under the influence of some mind-altering substance, but the only things in his system were popcorn and store brand soda. No, this was really happening. He stared open-mouthed at the screen, where Heather watched him expectantly. He was too stunned to speak. After a moment of silence, Heather sighed dejectedly, shaking her head, and turned back toward the stairs. She slowly walked back to the basement door, unlocked it, and pulled it open. There the killer was waiting with his expressionless burlap mask. The clerk's eyes widened and he cried out, NO! But it was too late. The film suddenly cut to black, and with a whirring sound, the VCR spat the tape back out. The clerk sat there, staring at the tape. What could he do with it? Should he make a copy, send it to someone else and pass the curse along? Should he try to watch it again? He wasn't sure he could bear to see Heather looking at him with those same pleading eyes. Then he remembered an ad he had seen in the back of his favorite comic book. Seen something you can't explain? A brush with the unknown keeping you up at night. We're looking for stories of the strange and unusual. Write to us now. Maybe they could do something he couldn't. He put the tape back into its cover, placed it in an envelope, and mailed it off the next day. A few days later, the package reached its intended recipient, an undercover branch of the SCP Foundation tracking anomalous activity via a series of ads in comic books and video stores to tap into one of the most underutilized resources in the world, nerds. The tape was designated SCP-5733, and Heather and the Mass Killer were designated SCP-5733-2 and SCP-5733-1, respectively. After an initial viewing confirmed its anomalous properties, a research team headed by Dr. Carpenter began to perform a series of tests. Testing was open to all Foundation employees, subject to approval by Dr. Carpenter. Approved personnel would be placed in a Site-73 multi-purpose room with a VHS player and a television. The staff member would then watch the movie and attempt to engage with Heather and help her escape. For the first test, D-Class 1973 was selected. When Heather turned to the camera and asked for help, he asked if she had a car. When she confirmed that yes, she did, he instructed her to sneak back upstairs, 
find her car keys, leave through the back door, and drive as fast and as far away as possible. She successfully retrieved the car keys, but when she reached the car, she saw that the tires had been slashed. Heather began to panic, but 1973 talked her through it, telling her to smash the window of a neighbor's car and unlock the door. She complied, and 1973 instructed her on how to hotwire the vehicle. The car started, and with a triumphant laugh, she sped out of the cul-de-sac. Just as her car began to pull away, the killer emerged from the back seat, wielding a kitchen knife. Heather screamed, and the tape cut to black. For the next test, D-Class 1944 was selected. He began by telling Heather to find her father's shotgun, seen earlier in the film, and use it to take out the killer before they could get to her. She snuck up to her parents' room and found the gun, only for the killer to appear in the doorway behind her. She aimed the gun and fired, but nothing happened. The killer opened their hand, dropping the shotgun shells on the floor. She was close, but the killer was one step ahead. She screamed as they approached with the knife, and again, the tape cut to black. After several tests were conducted with D-Class subjects and no adverse effects were reported, aside from the obvious trauma of failing to save Heather's life, testing was opened up to all Foundation staff. Assistant researcher Felissa Baker volunteered. She believed her extensive knowledge of the slasher genre would give her the tools to help Heather strategize. After speaking with Heather about her skills, which mainly included party planning and babysitting, Felissa determined that Heather should seek outside help. With Felissa's help, Heather made her way out of the house and over to the home of her next-door neighbor, Mr. Loomis. When she got there, the door was open and the lights were off. It didn't look great, but she didn't really have much of a choice but to go inside. She made her way to the bedroom where Mr. Loomis and his wife were lying in bed. She tried to wake him, but the camera zoomed in to reveal his throat had been slashed. The shape in the bed next to him sat up and was not in fact his wife, but the suburb slasher instead. As the figure raised their signature kitchen knife, the screen went to black. SCP-5733 became a competition of sorts among Foundation staff, each volunteer proposing their knowledge would help them get Heather to safety. Assistant researcher Nick Younglin Doskowitz proposed telling Heather to call for help, giving her a secret phone number for the SCP Foundation circa 1983, the time in which the movie was set. However, when Heather reached the phone, it had been destroyed, smashed to pieces. Next to it was a note written in blood that said, The only foundation here is fear. Then the killer appeared behind Heather, and the tape went to black. Somehow the killer knew about the SCP Foundation. Perhaps in a manner of speaking, the call was coming from inside the house. Next, field agent Malcolm Pleasance and Donald McDowell were selected due to their extensive knowledge of hand-to-hand -hand combat. They attempted to teach Heather various fighting and self-defense techniques, while she survived on the limited supplies available in the basement. She eventually left the basement, and when the killer appeared, began to fight them. After 23 minutes of combat, she knocked the slasher to the floor and grabbed the candlestick to finish them off. As the agents watching began to celebrate, a second version of the suburban slasher appeared behind her, lunging forward. Just before the new killer made contact, the tape cut to black. During this test, the slasher seemed more adept at combat than it had been before, as though it could hear the advice being given to Heather. With other techniques failing, field agent Tilda Joan Bennett was brought in for a test, selected due to her expertise in thaumaturgy. She instructed Heather on basic offensive and defensive thaumaturgy, before guiding her out of the house and into the front yard. When the slasher appeared brandishing their knife, Heather was able to sign a protective glyph and defend against the knife's blow. She followed this with a wind spell that pushed the killer further away. Heather began to run down the driveway, making a break for survival, when the slasher suddenly performed a freeze spell that rendered her unable to move. Heather's wide, panicked eyes stared down the barrel of the camera in a silent scream as the killer approached her, recovered the knife in hand before the tape went to black. Eventually, Dr. Carper volunteered to conduct a test. He instructed his research team to prepare a list of options for Heather's survival, divided into four categories. What to take from the basement, where to go once leaving the basement, how to exit the house, and how to escape the cul-de-sac. He was not informed about any of these options, but rather had them printed out and placed into plastic bowls on the day of the test. There were also three cards created and placed face down, reading face, body, and legs. When Heather addressed Dr. Carpenter, 
He informed her that he would be randomly selecting instructions for her, and asked that she follow them exactly. The first slip of paper instructed Heather to grab a pair of garden shears from the basement and climb the stairs back into the main house. Next, she was told to go upstairs to the bedroom, then downstairs into the dining room. She complied and there was no sign of the killer so far. Third, Dr. Carpenter told Heather to run back upstairs, out of the bedroom window, onto the roof, and then jump down into the garden. Then it was time for the next step. He told Heather to jump over the fence into the neighbor's garden and run down the street until she could find help. As Heather made her way down the road, the slasher broke through the front door of her house but did not chase after her. Heather continued running down the road for 20 minutes as the trees and lights began to dwindle. The surroundings began to grow darker and darker until they resembled a void. Dr. Carpenter instructed her to keep walking. She could make out lights and houses in the distance. She ran toward the neighborhood, but stopped suddenly and began to panic. She was back in her own neighborhood, in front of her own house, and the killer was waiting for her. As Heather demanded to know what to do, Carpenter flipped over one of the three cards. It read, Face, and so he told Heather to attack the killer's face with the shears, then the killer's legs, then his body. The killer dodged her attack, grabbed the shears, and pushed her to the ground. As Heather looked up at the killer, his face could be seen through the torn sack. It was Dr. Carpenter. Heather screamed, and the tape cut to black. Talk about a third act twist. The movie itself did not create the killer, but somehow the viewer did, and it also made the killer more creative. After this incident, all testing on SCP-5733 was suspended, and attempts to help turn Heather from victim to survivor were halted. Searching for answers, the Foundation looked into Crystal Elms Productions, the production company listed on the videotape's cover. No record of the production company, the film, or any of its cast could be found. Several months after testing on SCP-5733 was suspended, another tape was found. Because, let's face it baby, these days you've gotta have a sequel. The new tape was titled, The Suburb Slasher Strikes Again, and was purported to be produced by Crystal Elms Productions in 1985. It was designated SCP-6733. Unlike its predecessor, this tape was only tested once. A member of D-Class personnel was first shown SCP-5733 up until the point where it becomes anomalous, and was then shown SCP-6733. He was left completely alone in order to watch the contents of the tape. The following was what was on it. Dr. Malcolm Baines entered the testing chamber to find D-1974, or Jamie, sitting across from the television set. He introduced himself and ran a series of cognitive tests. He asked Jamie what he thought of the film and he said, eh, it was pretty much your standard slasher film. There's a group of teens who just graduated high school and go to a local camping site by a lake to celebrate. One of them mentions it's near the site where the killer, the slasher, was shot dead by police a year prior after a rampage. Dr. Baines clarified, asking if this was a reference to the first film. Jamie continued, It's not really clear, they all think it's a joke, apart from the main girl. She said her dad's a police officer and she's seen video evidence of the attack. No one references any of the characters from the first film, though, and they don't show up in this one either. The slasher's the only constant. According to Jamie, the main events of the film revolved around a lakeside camping trip and quickly began to go wrong. Dr. Baines inquired about the nature of the slasher's kills, and Jamie elaborated, He's still got a kitchen knife, same weapon as the first film, so he stabs a lot of them. It's pretty gory for the time it was made. He slashes up someone's face, then the nerdy guy gets stabbed through the eye. That one's pretty good. The camera gets sprayed with blood, one of the teens gets his head crushed wide open. Dr. Baines asked Jamie how the scenes made him feel, and he responded, Like, there's some good jump scares and the tension's fairly high at points, but it's a little dated. I've seen scarier, but I've also seen worse horrors. Only one part of the film stood out to him. He described it. So, the girl and her best friend, the one that's been looking out for her this whole time, enter into a cellar. The slasher creeps up from behind and grabs the friend, tears his head clean off his neck. The slasher then chases the other teen to the other side of the lake. He's advancing on her. The camera's set on the water of the lake. It's a wide shot. You've got the lake water line parallel to the top and bottom of the shot, so it splits the screen horizontally. She's fallen over, crawling away from him. As he advances on her, the camera zooms in. Slowly, though. It takes its time, and he does too. There's music at the start of the scene, like deep, dark synths. This stops as the camera moves closer, though. I forgot to say, it's, it's a long scene, longer than five minutes. Maybe it was ten? I don't know, it felt longer than ten. So, the slasher's approaching her. We're the viewers, 
approaching the shore. And then the music stops, and it's just his footsteps and her pleading. And, and she's pleading, man. She's... There's these big inhales of breath stifled by the mucus running out of her nose. And she's babbling, but it gets to the point she's not even saying words, just making noise. As Jamie continued, he began to grow increasingly distressed. The camera's real close to the shore now, and the slasher stops. He turns his head and looks straight at the camera. You can't see his eyes, but you know he's looking straight at you. And he just stands there, staring. Eventually, the girl crawls out of the frame, or the camera zooms past her. I, I can't remember which. It just keeps zooming in on his face. Where his face should be under the hood, the girl keeps screaming off camera, and then there's this guttural ripping noise, and the screaming stops. It just stops, but the camera keeps moving. You can see the individual droplets of blood splashed across him. You can see the fabrics that make up his hood. His face soon takes up the entire shot, and then black. No credits or nothing, the tape just cuts to black and was pushed out of the player. Dr. Baines pushed a bit, asking if there was anything anomalous he could be forgetting. Then Jamie thought of something. The girl, her friends, all of them, I, I don't think they had names. Jamie became increasingly disturbed by the film over time, calling Dr. Baines into his dormitory to ask him if they had shown him a snuff film. After falling asleep, he had a vivid dream of the lake, crawling alongside it, recalling the deaths of his friends at the hand of a masked killer. When he woke up, he saw a shadow outside the window of his room. It stood there, silent and unmoving, all night. It only vanished when the sun came up. The next night, surveillance caught the image of a humanoid shape running through the forest, but the guards found no trace of it. Dr. Baines returned to Jamie's cell to find him deeply distressed. He repeated over and over that the slasher was coming for him. Dr. Baines dismissed this concern. Once Jamie was alone, he stared into the mirror as the temperature began to drop. You're here, aren't you? He said. A gloved hand punctured through the mirror, spraying glass everywhere. On the other side, there he was, the suburb slasher. Jamie fled his dormitory and ran for his life as the slasher followed him. Security officer Lauren confronted the slasher, but they lifted him up by the neck and stabbed the familiar kitchen knife through his head. Jamie continued to make his way through the facility the slasher following and leaving a trail of destruction and bodies in his wake. Then, he reached Dr. Baines, who was confused by his behavior. Dr. Baines insisted that he needed to get to the basement, but terrified, Jamie resisted him. The two men scuffled, and Jamie shoved Dr. Baines hard, sending him careening into the wall. A lighting rig fell from the ceiling, landing on Dr. Baines. Several strangers ran into the room, calling for a medic on set, and asking for production and lighting to come back and reset everything. Off screen, a director yelled, CUT! The slasher's face appeared, taking up the entirety of the camera, and the tape cut to black. This version of the tape's events was created after the tape was watched by D1888 in a testing session with Dr. Carpenter. There has never been a Dr. Baines in the SCP Foundation's employ. Somehow, this second tape creates a localized destabilization of reality. It is unknown how many times it has actually been tested. So be careful what horror rentals you decide to watch. You might just find yourself in the middle of the action, and no matter what you think you know about surviving a slasher film, there will be no escape. You can run, but you certainly can't hide. Okay guys, so to wrap this video up, I really don't think this cursed episode of this show was real. It's obviously just a really good scary fan animation, and the fact that the creators behind it didn't come out and claim ownership of it sooner, allowing it to be reposted and re-uploaded so many times, is really what got people thinking was legit. That being said, it's still a good attempt at what a cursed lost episode would look like, so shout out to those animators, man. Anyway, I've been the Goat Hellholder 98 be sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel down below, and hey, if you know about any more lost media you want me to cover, leave it in the comments and I'll check it out. Oh, and be sure to follow my socials at hellholder98. I go live most days and post updates about new videos on my story, so go check it out. Alright, until then, I'll see you somewhere down the line. The moment his finger pushed the button to stop the camera recording, the practiced false smile dropped from Holden's face. It was hard not to feel down after he'd finished filming a new video, not thanks to any post-creativity slump, but the more depressing knowledge of just how much of an uphill battle this whole thing was. It felt like yesterday when Holden had first gotten into the creepier side of the internet. 
He never ventured into anything illicit or outright illegal, mind you. But there was a distinct corner of the web that had pulled him in when he was still at school and just starting to spend more time online. This part of the internet was filled with scary stories that were mostly fake or made up for likes, but that could have been real. There were unsettling animations, short clips that were hand-drawn to give people the creeps and keep them up at night. Not to mention a whole archive of public safety announcement videos, terrifying workplace and road safety warnings that used to be broadcast on TV and were as petrifying than the most acclaimed horror movies. Speaking of things that were broadcast to TV, that had gradually become Holden's specialty. One of his friends had sent him the link to a fictional account of someone who had supposedly uncovered an unaired episode of a Saturday morning kids cartoon, or so this person claimed anyway. They went on to describe bizarre imagery, so intense and terrifying that it was unbefitting of a show for children. Then, the person who made the original post explained how they got into contact with the show's creators via email to ask them about this cursed episode. The showrunner responded stating that the episode the poster had allegedly seen didn't even exist. To Holden, it didn't matter if the story was real or not. That wasn't the point. What was far more important was that it felt real. To him, it was plausible, even possible, that there were pieces of media out there in the world that had never seen the light of day. Episodes of TV shows or entire movies that were so wild and out there that they could have been banned and buried long before the dawn of the internet, wherein there was a record of everything and nothing was ever really lost. The idea of uncovering those lost pieces of media became Holden's primary hobby. He'd come home from school, throw his backpack onto his bed, and then sit in front of his computer for hours without even changing out of the clothes he had been wearing all day in class. But all the time he spent trawling through forum threads, following and messaging collectors on social media, listening to theories and coming up with his own, eventually it began to encroach on other things. Much to his mom's disappointment, Holden's grades took a rapid decline, and it wasn't long before he was failing his classes bad enough to not make the cut to continue on at school. But as much as it upset his mother, Holden really didn't mind. He was already thinking way beyond high school, and he knew he didn't need grades to be able to do the one thing he wanted to do with his life. Holden set up his own channel, with the plan to start uploading videos under his new online alter ego. And before long, Hellholder98 was born. He centered his whole internet persona around lost media, discussing which popular rumors were true and which were fictionalized for likes and clicks. It started out with a few discussion videos, where he would simply sit in his bedroom, a camcorder opposite him as he spoke. But before long, Holden was adding more and more flair to his content, learning how to edit on his computer, adding clips or screenshots he could find of supposed lost TV episodes to give his videos some credibility, a very necessary quality when trying to determine if certain things were real or not. Each video he finished, he had another two topics to a list of ideas he kept, planning to just perpetually churn out content until he eventually had a huge hit that went viral. Although the one thing he didn't realize until it was perhaps too late was that social media success didn't happen overnight. In fact, it didn't happen over many, many nights either. No matter how often Holden promoted his channel on his social media profiles, or how many new videos he uploaded, he couldn't seem to get any to land well and get boosted by the algorithm. At least that's one of the things he attributed the problem to. He pointed the finger of blame at anything that he could. One day, it was that the algorithm was suppressing his channel and boosting others who had already got more subscribers. The next, it might be his slow internet connection had led to one of his videos going live at a time when the site had low traffic. The one possibility that Holden didn't stop to consider was that maybe his genre of content was too niche, but that the days of the internet's interest in lost media had already peaked back when he was still in high school. Nevertheless, he kept trying, making content day in and day out working under the assumption that, if he just made enough videos, then one day he was sure to blow up. That would be his big break, his ultimate win, a video that did well enough to garner thousands, if not millions, of views. But the more time he devoted to Hellholder98, the only number that seemed to be at all increasing was the number of videos he had posted, each one barely garnering view figures that were above a single digit. To make matters worse, getting help with growing his online brand was next to impossible, 
Every now and then, he would post on forums asking for advice, or if anyone wanted to collaborate so he could gain some exposure from creators with bigger followings. Those posts were often met with a slew of apathetic, snide responses, or comments telling Holden to just, quote, make better content, as if that was solid, specific advice. On top of that, his mom had outright refused to support her son's chosen career path, citing his failure at school as the main reason. Speaking of, any friends Holden previously had at school had all moved away in the years since, going off to pursue college and other higher education. Some were even starting their new and exciting professions. The old saying said, it's lonely at the top, but Holden was just as lonely down at the bottom, posting his content in total obscurity, as if he was just shouting into an empty void with no one around to hear. The few people Holden did still consider his friends were all as chronically online as he was, most of them fellow lost media collectors. After interacting with them in the common threads of various forums, the handful of like-minded guys were as close as Holden had to people actively supporting his channel. The collectors would usually give him pointers or topics to discuss in videos and contributing to the single-digit view count underneath his uploads. Although to him, it wasn't nearly enough. He didn't want just his friends to see his videos. He wanted an audience, a fan base of his own. It was late, the light of the computer monitor illuminating the dark of Holden's bedroom. Hunched over his desk, he was clicking and dragging clips into the timeline of a video project, trimming them down to make the whole thing better paced, snipping out bad takes where he stumbled over his words or misspoke. It was while editing that Holden noticed another screen lighting up on his desk, accompanied by a vibration, his phone. He reached for it, seeing a notification popped up on the lock screen. It was from Goth, one of the lost media collectors, and it read, Dude, urgent, found something that you can make a video on. Holden sighed. It was late, and he was already focused on editing this current video tonight. If he got it finished, then he could go to sleep. What do you know about the Deathly videotape? Goth asked in a second message, before Holden even had a chance to open it first. The what? He replied bluntly, before sending another text saying, Can't this wait until the morning? I'm trying to edit. If you don't act fast, it'll be gone forever, came the response only a second later, followed by a link. Lethargically, Holden tapped the hyperlink Goth had sent, his phone opening up its browser and displaying the web page. It was a buy and sell website. One of those places where people offloaded junk they didn't want anymore to strangers for a bit of extra cash. The page in question showed a few grainy photos taken on a phone of a small rectangular object in someone's hand. What is that? Holden asked. It's a videotape, bonehead, Goth fired back. Although they'd never met in person, Holden always got the sense his friend was a little older than he was. Looking back on the seller's ad, it was for a second-hand Sony Color Collection 60-90 to minute mini-DV videotape, a type of cassette used in a lot of old handheld recording cameras. So what? Holden asked in another text. Look, there have been rumors for ages about something called the Deathly Videotape. Goth replied in a series of rapid-fire messages. It used to be all the rage on a lot of old lost media forums, the real nasty ones before they got shut down. Supposedly, there's a recording on this tape of some kind of live show. Except when you put in your VCR and press play, you see something horrible. Nobody even knows if it's real or just a legend. How do you know this is the same tape? Holden queried. By now, he had typed out the same link on his computer and was looking at the for sale page on the bigger screen while he texted back and forth with Goth. Read the item description, he answered. Holden's eyes scanned down the page, finding a short message from the seller. To anyone interested, I'm giving this old mini DV tape away. I don't know where I got it or why I watched it, but I wish I hadn't. It had ruined everything for me. It's impossible to enjoy anything else now that I've seen what's on it. Let me make this clear, I am not selling this tape, I'm giving it away free of charge. I hope that getting rid of it will help. Sounds ominous, Holden texted. If you're so sure if this is the Deathly videotape, then why don't you get it? Keep reading, Goth responded. Underneath the item description was another note that the seller had written. Please note, I am unable to leave my town at present, nor can I mail this tape to anyone even if you pay postage. Collection only. If you're interested, please contact me at the following address. Below was an address. It was in Holden's hometown, only a few streets away from where he and his mom lived. This could be it, dude. Came another slew of messages from Goth. You buy this tape and make a video recording, then you might finally go viral. But you better be quick before someone goes and picks it up thinking it's just an ordinary tape. Holden looks back at the address, double-checking where it was. At most, it'd take a quick walk there and back, he thought. 
And if this tape was as elusive as Goth said it was, then owning it would mean Holden would be the only one who could make a video featuring it. After messaging the seller the night before, Holden found himself rushing through his quiet neighborhood to the address. All night as he tried to sleep, he kept thinking of the video he was going to make, how it could finally put him on the map, and at long last, bring him the e-fame he'd been working towards. Wrapping his knuckles against the front door, he was met by an older man who stood on the other side. He was walking with a crutch, with a few bruises and stitched up cuts on his face. The second that Holden explained he was there for the tape, the man reached to an unseen shelf just inside the doorframe and thrust the rectangular cassette into his hands before shutting the door as quickly as he could without it hitting Holden square in the face. He stared at the tape in his hands, though through its transparent green plastic case, he could see a hand-scrawled note. I know you'll ignore me if I tell you not to watch this, it read. So if you do, then on your own head be it. Having spent the rest of the day looking up exactly what he'd need to play such an old outmoded recording format and convert the footage to digital so he could include it in his video, Holden had retrieved his mom's old VHS player from the attic, wiping the thick layer of dust off of it. It took a while for him to get everything ready to go, not just finding the right adapters and cables to hook the VCR up to his TV, as well as linking that to his computer, plus angling his camera right, and making sure the ring light he'd bought for filming was putting enough focus on his face. After the substantial prep, Holden took a deep breath, summoning up the faux excitement and stage smile, before he hit the record button on his camera. What's up guys, it's Hellholder98 here. Now today I've got a real treat for you all. So my friend Goth, shout out to him, told me that a while ago, there was talk about something called the Deathly Videotape. We found a mini DV tape that we think might be that very same tape, so we're gonna watch it and see if it's legit. Dropping his persona as his face turned away from the camera, Holden punched the play button on the VHS player. His eyes glued to the TV screen as the camera's lens was fixated on him. Okay, nothing so far, he observed, met with nothing but a blank, black screen. Suddenly, after 12 seconds of nothing, the playback started instantly, and Holden started relaying what he was seeing on the tape to the camera. There was no sound, either because the recording on the videotape was filmed in that way, or Holden had improperly figured out how to hook it up to the VHS. The video itself showed a recording of Sesame Street Live, and for the most part just seemed pretty underwhelming. Characters were up on stage, their puppeteers managing to stay out of sight as they entertained their young audience. After two and a half minutes, Holden was starting to feel like he'd gone to all this effort over what seemed to just be someone's old, unwanted home video. Just as he was considering turning off the camera and throwing the videotape in the trash, at almost the three minute mark, something weird started happening on the stage. The actor playing one of the bigger characters seemed to be having some trouble, instantly trying to pull off his cumbersome costume, much to the distress of the kids in the audience looking on in horror. But it wasn't just the illusion that had been broken. The actor was trying to get out of his costume because he was choking. He dropped to his knees on stage, clawing at his own throat before finally falling face down, totally still, asphyxiated, dead. Over the next almost 20 seconds, the same thing started happening to another three of the characters on stage all of them violently choking while the children in the audience screamed and cried silently on the inaudible tape. Then, at three and a half minutes, the video cut out. Holden was unsure how to react, at first a little creeped out, only to be somewhat bemused. He played it down for the camera, remarking that the video seemed tame compared to some of the more graphic fake content he'd seen. But the whole time, even after rapping, recording, sitting awake all night to edit his reaction video, blurring out the parts that would break the terms of service, he had no idea what he'd seen was actually real or not. Finishing the final edit just as the sun was coming up, Holden hit upload and crawled into bed while his video was uploaded. The buzz of a text message from Goth awoke him. Dude, I told you this video was going to make it big. Without even replying, Holden booted up his computer and opened the page for his newly uploaded video. The view count was already in the thousands and climbing, comments pouring in underneath, mostly from people debating whether or not the contents of the tape had been faked. Holden punched the air in excitement. He'd finally done it. But as the video kept playing, he heard a retching sound coming from the computer's speakers. He turned to look back at his earlier self, filmed only the night before. Except what he was seeing play out on screen now wasn't what he remembered happening last night. It couldn't have, because the Holden in that video was choking. That wasn't possible. He was alive and watching his own video right now. 
but somehow the footage was shown him dying, his airway blocked, face turning red, then blue as tears streamed down his cheeks. In the video, Hellholder98 fell down, dead from asphyxiation, and watching it made Holden feel sick. To make matters worse, none of the comments under the video seemed to have witnessed the same ending. Holden even texts Goth to ask if the same thing had happened, but he described the ending exactly as Holden remembered filming it. But afterwards, it didn't stop happening. Everything he watched ended the same. Every clip online, every TV show, every movie. Holden couldn't even read a book without some characters, fictional or otherwise, keeling over and choking to death, just like the characters on the tape. He barely had time to acknowledge the hits his reaction to the deathly videotape were getting. He was too busy trying to figure out why he couldn't stop seeing people dying the exact same way, even himself when he watched back his old Hellholder 98 videos. Reacting to the deathly videotape garnered a respectable 3 million views, but Hellholder 98 never uploaded again afterwards. His channel went silent, remembered only as a one-hit wonder, until the video and the entire channel were taken down. Holden was never reported missing. The Foundation made sure of that when they came by to collect SCP-583 and place the videotape into containment. Hey, do you have a favorite reality show? Oh, come on, don't lie, everyone has one. Dr. Clef loves some American Ninja Warrior, and I've got it on good authority that Dr. Bright can't get enough of The Bachelor. So how about you, huh? Do you obsessively follow the romantic highs and lows of Love Island? Or are you more of the type who likes to curl up with a mug of hot cocoa and enjoy a nice, wholesome episode of The Great British Baking Show? Do you ever yell at the TV when the contestants on Jeopardy just can't get the answer right? Do you get a kick out of seeing what crazy collectibles will show up on this week's episode of Pawn Stars? If you answered yes to any of these, you're not alone. Millions of people around the world still tune in to all kinds of reality TV. Personally, I just can't get enough of my favorite hidden camera show, Laugh is Fun. What's that? You've never heard of Laugh is Fun? No! <laughs> oh boy, you're really missing out. If you like reality TV, you're going to love Laugh is Fun. Laugh is Fun, also known as SCP-2030, isn't a show that you can watch on TV. Instead, it appears as the most popular form of media distribution in the current year. Today, you can find it on file sharing and streaming websites. But in the 2000s, you could rent it from the DVD kiosk at the mall. And back in the 90s, it used to show up as multi-tape sets in video rental stores. Even though the SCP Foundation has only been aware of Laugh is Fun since 1993, it has a recorded 38 seasons as of 2014, meaning that it may have existed in some form as far back as the 1970s. If you want to binge all 38 seasons, you might also want to look it up under the names Laugh is Life, or in some countries, Laugh is Laugh. And if you happen to be in a country where Laugh is Laugh isn't available, you may want to try changing your location using a VPN to one where you can access it. Oh, what's that? You don't have a VPN service? Well then, I'm glad you're here. Because before we go any further, I have a very important word from our sponsor, who just so happens to be NordVPN. The preferred VPN service of all the researchers here at SCP Explained. Sign up now at nordvpn.com forward slash SCP Explained. NordVPN isn't just a VPN, it's truly the best VPN available. With a simple click, you'll be able to access content that might be blocked just because of your location, so you'll never have to miss an episode of your favorite anomalous television programs. But wait, there's more, much, much more. What if you're right in the middle of binge-watching of season 31 when suddenly your quality dips to looking like a couple of blurry blocks are fighting over an old shoebox? Never fear, because NordVPN encrypts all of your traffic. That means your internet service provider can't throttle your service and slow down your streaming speed. You should never settle for less than the highest quality pixels, after all. And it doesn't matter how you choose to watch. NordVPN is available on every modern platform, including Windows, iOS, Android, macOS, Linux, and even Android TV. The monthly cost is the same as a cup of coffee. Regular coffee, that is, not the kind that comes from SCP-294. And if you sign up by going to nordvpn.com forward slash SCP Explained, you'll even get a free month. So go try it for yourself right now. That's nordvpn.com forward slash SCP Explained. Now, back to your regularly scheduled programming. As we were saying, Laugh is Fun is a prank show that puts unknowing everyday people into ridiculous scenarios and films their reactions. 
Each episode is about 10 to 12 minutes long and features an opening and closing monologue from beloved, supposedly human TV presenter Laffy McLafferson, aka SCP-2030-1. You've probably seen him before. He's never seen without his blue three-piece suit and black wingtip shoes. Funniest guy on TV, seriously. I think he should replace James Corden on The Late Late Show, and maybe even take up hosting a gig on SNL, if he's still got time after. He had this amazing monologue at the end of an episode in season 32. Ha <laughs> ha, what a ride, huh, folks? We've seen printers that eat, eaters that print, and everything in between. Makes you appreciate the old clunker you have at the back office, doesn't it? No, printers may not always work when you want or need them to, but they sure make for some excellent comedy. And that's what we're all about here. Comedy. We're here to make you laugh. We hope you laughed. Thank you for laughing with us. That's what we're about here, doesn't it, folks? Come laugh with us again next time. And remember, laugh is fun. Good night and laugh and laugh. Just laugh. We love the make laugh. Make more for laughter so as to for laugh. Laugh with us. 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 Laugh, laugh, laugh. Laugh and let us in. Hmm. I couldn't tell you what his face looks like, though, because he's always framed from the neck down. Once the pranks are done for the episode, he'll step up on that bright yellow stage and deliver his closing monologue, which always ends with a pan over the audience as everyone chants, Laugh with us. Then the show always just cuts to black. The closest thing the show ever has to credits is a title card that says, filmed in front of a studio audience in partnership with YWTGTHFT. For a show that doesn't advertise or even air on TV, Laugh is Fun is still a beloved classic, and when you watch it, it's easy to see why it's been around so long. Laffy and the team pull off some really classic pranks on Laugh is Laugh. There's this one episode in season 13 where an unsuspecting family is sitting down to dinner, Father starts choking and the family reacts with horror until suddenly a pair of slits appear in the father's neck allowing him to breathe. Those slits soon become nostrils and before you know it a full second head grows out of his neck. That head then grows its own neck which grows a noose, then a face, then another head, then another neck. This keeps happening a total of 18 times while the rest of the family looks on in horror. But don't worry, before things go too far, Laffy pops out from under the table and tells the family they're on Laugh is Fun. Laffy points out the cameras and the whole family starts laughing including all 18 of the father's heads. There's also another great season 13 episode called Squirrels. Oh man, okay, this one had me in stitches. All right, so there's this couple lying in bed and the wife wakes up because she hears this squeaking noise. She taps her husband on the shoulder to wake him up, but she draws her hand back in horror because she can feel something moving under her husband's skin. So before she can ask if he's okay, boom, Hundreds of squirrels explode out of his skin and start running around the room while the wife screams. Then Laffy walks in and turns the lights on, accompanied by the husband, who is perfectly okay, even though he's been skinned from head to toe. Everyone laughs. All right, then there's the most recent episode from season 24 called Swelling. There's this old lady sitting on a park bench feeding the pigeons and a couple walks past her. When they walk past, the old lady gets swarmed by the pigeons she's feeding. The pigeons force themselves into her mouth and keep swarming until her stomach cavity bursts open. The couple, who gets sprayed with guts as the, all the pigeons fly off, are extremely distressed by this until Laffy shows up. Some people say that this episode is too similar to Squirrels and that the show was starting to get stale at this point, but I think the joke is unique enough to stand on its own. Plus, with a prank show as long-running as Laugh, it's inevitable that you're gonna see some jokes get reused. Really, it's not about the prank itself, it's about the reactions of the people, which are always priceless. And man, the way that Laffy McLafferson comes into the frame by climbing out of the old lady's open ribcage, I was rolling on the floor. Ah, oh, you don't think the old animals exploding out of people bit is funny? Uh, okay, that's fair enough. Uh, let me think. What are some of my other favorite episodes of Laugh is Fun? Oh, yes! The Margaret Thatcher episode from season 21. That's another great thing about Laugh is Fun. It's not afraid to get a little political. So, this woman walks into her kitchen and opens the cabinet, but instead of the food being in there, it's just a big blob of flesh. The flesh blob rolls out onto the counter and morphs into a misshapen caricature of Margaret Thatcher with a disproportionately big head. The woman starts screaming, but the Thatcher creature jumps onto her, pinning her down and shoving its tongue into her mouth. The deeper the tongue goes, the more Margaret Thatcher faces start appearing all over the woman's skin. All the faces start reciting Thatcher's April 1986 speech on the bombing of Libya in perfect unison. You might watch it and think the woman's going to choke based on how long the creature's tongue is down her throat, but good old Laffy comes in and the studio audience goes nuts. Laffy points out to the cameras and says, You're on Laugh is Fun! 
and the woman starts laughing too with the creature's tongue still in her mouth. But I think my favorite prank I've ever seen on Laugh is Fun was the one from season 37. So it's in a hospital. There's a woman getting a c-section and all the doctors are gathered around. One of the doctors makes a comment on how much hair the baby has, and then he screams and drops his surgical tools. The rest of the team all start screaming as well and then, this is where it gets really funny, you see Ryan Seacrest's head pop up from out of the woman. <laughs> okay, so this is causing her a lot of pain, obviously, so she starts screaming and crying as the Ryan Seacrest head fully emerges, at which point you can tell that its head is on an octopus body. Classic bait and switch, right? But that's not the end. The Ryan Seacrest octopus starts singing row, row, row your boat as it emerges, and then three more octopi with celebrities' heads come out of this woman. There's one that looks like Jack Nicholson, one that looks like Johnny Cash, and one who looks like Martin Freeman. And when they've all come out of her, they start singing together in four-part harmony. It's hilarious. Laffy walks in to point out the cameras, and all the doctors start laughing. Even the woman on the operating table is laughing. In fact, she laughs so hard she passes out. It's a real shame that there are never any end credits, because it would be so cool to find out more about the people who make this show. I mean, they're total comedic geniuses, and special effects wizards too. I couldn't even guess how they do some of those pranks. But sadly, there's very little information about the show online, and you can't even ask the victims of the pranks about it, because all of them are dead. What? No, 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 not because of Laugh is Fun, that's just a prank show, it's all jokes. They always show everyone laughing and perfectly okay at the end, no matter how badly they got mutilated in the episode. You can even see some people who have been on previous episodes among the studio audiences if you look hard enough. But, okay, by total coincidence, everyone who is featured on Laugh is Fun eventually dies or is already dead of totally unrelated causes. Like the Terman family. Dad Gary Terman was the one who had 18 extra heads grow out of his neck. Gary, his wife Lindsay, and their two kids tragically passed away in a car wreck on the 28th of April 1989. Melissa and Travis Younglin, the couple from the squirrel prank, went missing and were last seen on the 12th of May 1989. The couple from the pigeon prank, Macy Gershon and Kyle Parker, were both killed by a hit-and-run driver in September of 2000. Doris Carter, the woman from the Thatcher prank, passed away from ovarian cancer in 1997. And Rebecca Nash, the woman who gave birth to all those singing celebrity cephalopods, died in childbirth in 2013. You might think that the last one had something to do with her Laugh is Fun episode due to the hospital connection, but the surgeons present when she died didn't report anything strange happening at the time. All of these deaths happen in roughly the same years that all these people had their appearances on Laugh, but it's because it's only available on streaming and video. It can't really be said what the connection is since there aren't any air dates for any of the episodes. While you might assume that these people died after their appearances on Laugh and the show is actually some kind of death curse, it's just as likely that they died before, and Laugh is Fun is somehow filmed and distributed from the great beyond. Some people even think that the people who film Laugh actually kidnap all the people who appear on the show and fake their deaths in some kind of big sinister conspiracy. Sure, I have heard that all of the people who supposedly died after being on the show have inconsistencies in their death records, and that many of their graves actually just hold empty coffins, but still, that feels totally unrealistic to me. I mean, come on, can you really picture TV's own Laffy Lafferson kidnapping anyone? He has such a friendly attitude. Like I said before, no information whatsoever exists about the way this show is made. Not even the SCP Foundation has any answers. They're still actively investigating the ways in which people get chosen to be on Laugh is Fun, as well as where it's filmed and who produces it. Talk about a really niche cult hit. I hope I've sold you on Laugh is Fun. It may not be that well known, and you might have trouble finding it. But trust me, it's the funniest prank show you'll probably ever watch. I guarantee once you get into it, it'll make you laugh and laugh and laugh. Laugh with us. Laugh with us. Laugh with us. Laugh with us. Have you ever wanted to be in a cartoon? They have it easier than we do, that's for sure. The characters in your favorite shows never seem to experience boring days, and the world around them always seems so wonderful and imaginative. Animation is an idealized, stylized form of reality, where anything can happen and entertainment is at the forefront of the lived experience. If you're understanding the appeal behind what we're talking about, you'll definitely be interested in hearing about SCP-6080, a strange anomaly known as Eric's Cartoon Box. The story of Eric's Cartoon Box is elaborate and complex, but catalogs one of the Foundation's most imaginative and surreal anomalies on file. It started on Parawatch.net, 
a message board dedicated to the supernatural and paranormal that the Foundation likes to keep tabs on in their spare time. While sifting through countless fake posts about being abducted by aliens or hunting for Bigfoot, the Foundation noticed something less conventional that caught their eye. A series of posts that talked about a cursed VHS tape of the mid-90s classic Nickelodeon cartoon, Rocco's Modern Life. Now, a cursed cartoon seems like your standard internet horror fiction fare, something the Foundation could easily dismiss as a story crafted by an amateur author, but what caught their attention were the pictures of strange entities that appeared as a result of watching the tape, as well as information on how the original poster obtained the tape. It seemed oddly specific. A tape purchased on eBay through a seller named Toon Collector. The Foundation conducted a brief investigation and found that Toon Collector was a resident of Bakersfield, California, named Jacob Sawyer, who had gone missing some time in the past. Inside his house, the Foundation found several VHS tapes and DVD cases, as well as a television. A hard drive on Sawyer's computer contained 161 hours of brief edited videos, all reviewing and commenting on various cartoons. Seems like Sawyer had a video essay hobby. But the Foundation was unable to locate any of this content on major video hosting sites. In Sawyer's basement, the Foundation discovered a large, worn-out cardboard box. On its right side were the words, Eric's Cartoon Box, written in black Sharpie. On its front was a simplistic smiley face, also drawn in Sharpie. Originally, the Foundation thought it was just an ordinary box, but the object quickly proved itself to be alive capable of speaking despite a lack of vocal cords, and also possessing a large degree of mobility, propelling itself short distances to move. When the Foundation first came across SCP-6080 in Sawyer's basement, the object was clearly distressed. SCP-6080 and all of the other items found were taken into Foundation custody and moved to Site-433, where they would be researched by Dr. Rowan Raster, one of the Foundation's leading figures in the study of animated, anomalous media and art. Raster's research found that SCP-6080, when emotionally distressed, could bend reality to alter their surroundings, which were transformed into reflections of its psyche. Raster discovered that there were a few ways to pacify SCP-6080, but the most practical method was to evoke a sense of nostalgia in the object by placing it in a familiar environment. To ensure that the box is kept passive, SCP-6080 is kept inside a containment chamber resembling a child's bedroom, an environment SCP-6080 finds comforting. On top of their reality-bending abilities, SCP-6080 also produces DVDs and VHS tapes, labeled SCP-6080-1. The Foundation would later discover that the tapes found within Sawyer's home and the cursed Rocco's Modern Life tape discussed on Parawatch.net were all products of SCP-6080. But what's so special about the cartoon reproductions made by 6080? On the outside, they're unaltered copies of animated children's television shows and films, and their contents are exactly the same as their ordinary counterparts. However, once an instance of SCP-6080-1 is viewed, the subject watching it will experience a reality-altering anomalous experience, dubbed by the research team as a rerun event. Sometimes the rerun event occurs immediately, though research has shown that as much time as three weeks can pass before one occurs. Rerun events often reflect visual or thematic elements of the media that induce them, and their severity ranges from inconsequential to dangerous and harmful to their subjects. Because of the variety found in a rerun event's content, it is difficult to generalize them, but we'll be sure to get into the specifics of a few later on. Still, if the event isn't immediately dangerous to the subject, the Foundation discovered that a rerun event may leave involved persons with lingering physical and psychological alterations, some of which are unable to be fully alleviated or treated, even with amnestics. Soon after SCP-6080 was brought into Site-433 and the immediate characteristics of the anomaly were recorded, an interview between the box and researcher Rowan Raster was held. Rowan tried to make sure that the anomaly was as comfortable as possible, but SCP-6080 continued to shuffle against the floor rapidly, unsettled in their new environment. SCP-6080 wanted to get out, and the object continued to stress themselves out, 
To the point where its speech degraded into unintelligibility, the lights in the containment chamber began flickering on and off, and the face on the front of the box rapidly flipped between different expressions. Rowan tried to continue to get through to SCP-6080, and eventually they began to speak. They said that they were scared, and that they missed someone that they called Eric. SCP-6080 once calmed down explained that Eric was the center of their universe. In their own words, SCP-6080 felt, when it first started existing, that their sole purpose for being here on Earth was to exist for Eric. They remembered waking up in a bedroom filled with toys and posters, and immediately knowing the feeling that they knew what they were made for, and who they were made by. At first, this was overwhelming, and SCP-6080 began to freak out, but Eric showed concern, and the box realized that they didn't want to upset him. The most important thing for SCP-6080 was to not upset Eric. When Raster asked if they could describe Eric, the box was unable to, and said that whenever they tried to talk about Eric's appearance, people became confused. They said that Eric's skin was blue, and that he had a purple nose, with dark red eyes and four thin strands of hair on top of his head. From the way they described Eric, he sounded exactly like a cartoon character. Raster asked if this was how SCP-6080 always saw people, and that seemed to be the case. SCP-6080 then explained how they used their abilities to make Eric happy, namely through producing tapes of Eric's favorite cartoons and then playing inside the worlds of the shows together. And this continued for a while. SCP-6080 and Eric would meet the characters from their favorite shows and adventure through their worlds, and the two developed a powerful bond. But eventually, as SCP-6080 explained, Eric left. One day, the box woke up, and their friend was gone. SCP-6080 even searched for Eric's friends, but found that they were gone too. Without Eric, SCP-6080 was alone, and they panicked. They ran outside the house and began asking anyone they could find if they knew where Eric went. Naturally, the people SCP-6080 spoke to were terrified, and SCP-6080 quickly became overwhelmed by the chaos of the outside world. And then they found Jacob Sawyer. Sawyer was, at first, just as scared of SCP-6080 as everyone else was. But once SCP-6080 opened its flaps and revealed a trove of old tapes, Sawyer smiled to himself and told the box that it would be useful before picking them up and taking them to his house. SCP-6080 was scared and attempted to flee from Sawyer. The more time the box spent with Sawyer, the sicker it felt. When Sawyer threw the box in the empty, white walls of his basement, SCP-6080 was forced by Jacob to open themselves up and produce tapes. For months, this is how SCP-6080 lived, alone in a white-walled room with white floors and white ceilings, being forced open and used as a dispenser for the tapes, which Sawyer would sell online. SCP-6080 stopped their account and began crying a substance that resembled blueberry syrup. Raster put a stop to the interview, realizing that the object was clearly experiencing a form of trauma. After a break, Raster asked SCP-6080 if they knew what happened to Sawyer. The box explained that one day, Sawyer rushed down into the basement and demanded SCP-6080 to explain what it was doing to the cartoons it made. Apparently, some of the buyers were realizing that SCP-6080's tapes were anything but normal. Sawyer brutalized the box and pulled the DVD from inside them. But when Sawyer watched the DVD for himself, all SCP-6080 heard from beneath the living room was a sharp burst of static and a horrible scream. After that, Jacob was gone. SCP-6080 couldn't recall what tape they had produced that caused Sawyer to disappear, nor was one matching the box's description found inside the house. After the interview, the Foundation began its testing with SCP-6080 inside its containment chamber. SCP-6080 would produce a tape, a D-Class personnel would watch it, and the ensuing rerun event was recorded. During testing, SCP-6080 was escorted from the room so as to not cause it emotional distress. Most of these tests were routine. A D-Class would watch an episode of a cartoon, such as Chalk Zone or The Rugrats, and strange, reality-altering events would occur. For example, after watching an episode of The Rugrats where Chucky had difficulty differentiating his dreams from reality, 
D1711 experienced a rerun event in which he was disoriented. D1711 claimed everything in the room looked tall and that they needed to sleep off the effects of the anomaly. After laying in the bed, the chamber's lights turned blue and purple, and a humanoid entity wearing a researcher's outfit was seen facing the corner of the room against the wall. The figure disappeared as quickly as it appeared, with laughter heard in the distance. As soon as the figure was gone, D1711 jolted awake and began screaming. After this, the researcher observing the experiment rushed in, and like a concerned parent, began comforting D1711. The researcher assured the D-Class that nothing in a dream could hurt them, because it isn't real, which was a direct quote from the Rugrats episode D1711 watched. After this, the D-Class and the researcher came out of their trance state, wondering how they got inside the containment chamber and what they were doing there. The rerun event had finished, and D1711 explained that while they were asleep, they dreamed events similar to the dream shown in the Rugrats episode. This is just one example of how odd and surreal rerun events can be. Another test involving an obscure cartoon by the name of King, resulting in the entirety of Site 433 undergoing changes that made it look as if it were a location from the show itself. However, the most notable rerun event occurred when the Foundation tested a tape of Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue, a special featuring cartoon characters from various shows banding together to talk about the dangers of children using drugs. In order to conduct this test, D-9926 was sent to a quarantine community away from Site-433 with only a helmet-mounted camera and a communication headset. Ten hours after watching the tape, D-9926 slept inside a bedroom of the vacant building the Foundation had brought him to. He was woken by the sound of a doorknob jittering and then several knocks. D-9926 got up from the bed and opened the door to find four crude-looking entities resembling cartoon characters from the special. One was Kermit the Frog, who was puppeteered by a man in a gray hoodie. Another was a cardboard cutout of Bugs Bunny. There was a tall mascot-like Garfield costume and a sentient elf plush. The four entities crowded D-9926 and began singing to him in a shrill, high-pitched voice a song about the dangers of doing drugs. D-9926 was confused, but the trance induced by the anomaly made it difficult for him to think straight. Then from the open windowsill in the room came a black boot attached to a long leg. A fifth entity made its way into the room, crawling through the windowsill. It was a tall, gray-skinned humanoid with wrinkled trousers, a creased shirt, and a large necktie. As much as D-9926 could understand, the gray entity was not from a cartoon. The gray entity signaled D-9926 towards them, and the two left the building and the strange cartoon entities behind. Outside, the environment was strange. It was dark out, with only dim streetlights illuminating the spaces between trees at a low angle. The asphalt path the duo walked on slowly transitioned to a field of grass. The gray entity explained that the very nature of the environment was built around the message of the cartoon, which was trying to get D-9926 to avoid using drugs. Somehow, D-9926 needed to find a way to get out. As the two moved through the forest area, D-9926 and the gray entity continued to recognize something was wrong. Gray explained that it didn't understand where they were either. And that's when D-9926's rerun event began altering reality. It was pulled away from the place it regularly existed, and into reality. D-9926 did not understand, but he was short on options. Both of them smelled something horrible, and the area around them was starting to resemble the real world less and less. The sky above the forest was smoky orange-red, and in the distance, D-9926 could see a luminescent object resembling a window recessed into a concrete wall. The two also heard music, and as they moved through this dreamlike world, they came across a building in the distance, which was small enough for them to climb the roof of. On the roof there appeared to be a parking lot, and beyond it more forest, as if they never elevated from the ground in the first place. The two continued walking. As the parking lot sloped downwards, they recognized what appeared to be a city in the distance. Dean knew that with the altered state of reality, 
This city was going to be anything but normal, but he felt compelled to keep moving. It was the only thing the two of them could do. D-9926 and the Grey Entity began talking about the nature of the reality they found themselves in, and the Entity explained that it felt that trusting its gut and exploring anything that stood out was probably the right thing to do in a place that made little actual sense. They concluded that the location they were inside had some sort of feelings and goals, and they just had to go along with its own internal logic in order to find a way out. In the distance, the red lights of the city twinkled in the darkness. They continued walking. After 30 minutes, the red lights of the city illuminated all of their surroundings, and they began to see the edifices of concrete buildings on the other side of the road they were walking on. D-9926 didn't notice them at first, but when the entity pointed them out, D-9926 realized they were standing in the middle of a mass of buildings, with rubble and litter strewn on the streets beneath them. Gray wondered if they could use them as shelter. The two didn't realize that they were being watched by a figure in the distance. D-9926 was still confused. The city was empty. Gray seemed oddly optimistic about their situation, and things weren't looking like they were going to return to normal anytime soon. Gray commented that they were somewhat interested in exploring a location different from the realities and dreams they were used to exploring. After minutes of nothing, the duo came across a dead body, laying on top of a rusted metal wheelbarrow. D-9926, who was familiar with seeing sights like these, sighed and continued moving. Gray told him he could simply walk away, into the darkness, where they could forget about this place and emerge somewhere else. D-9926 wondered if the entity really had that power. They came across more bodies and continued forward. If this entity could really whisk D-9926 away to another place, he was seriously considering it. Life as a D-Class was unimaginably dehumanizing. The figure watching the two of them continued to observe from a rooftop. Suddenly, a large sheet metal shelving unit fell from the overhanging roof of a building, tipped from its edge by the observing figure. The shelving unit hit Gray directly and severely injured the entity on impact. D-9926 ran. He ran through the buildings, only catching glimpses of the orange figure wielding a thick pipe running across the rooftops beside him. The chase continued through the insides of the buildings, and once D-9926 caught a glimpse of the pursuing figure, he ran back out. The entire time, he heard the figure's high-pitched breathing audibly chasing after him. More bodies, more red lighting, and endless city, all while being pursued. D-9926 found rest inside a warehouse, which he ran through in an attempt to escape the entity. At the far side of the warehouse was a room resembling SCP-6080's containment chamber, but heavily damaged and littered with trash. The television set in the room switched on showed an all-white room, similar to the basement SCP-6080 was found in. The door to the room was about to be opened, and D-9926 screamed before smashing the TV with a book he threw from across the room. Upon shattering the screen, the camera feed went dark. When it resumed, D-9926 found himself in a red, misty area, with a figure that had been pursuing him standing right in front of him. The two stared at each other, before the figure lunged forward at D-9926. But then, it suddenly stopped, and the voice of SCP-6080 was heard. The box called out to the figure, which it recognized as something that resembled Jacob Sawyer. SCP-6080 ordered the Sawyer entity to leave D-9926 alone, except this time, SCP-6080 wasn't a cardboard box. They were a pale-skinned child, drawn like a cartoon, wearing ordinary clothes. The box realized that this place was a manifestation of its own traumatic experience as it slowly realized that the entity resembling Sawyer was stuck in its own mind. The box and the entity fought each other, punching with large cartoon-like fists, until the Sawyer entity fell to the ground, coughing up blood. SCP-6080 realized that this wasn't actually Sawyer. Like everything, this was all a manifestation of the damage that Sawyer caused. And with that, the entity left its own body, flattening until all that was left was its empty skin. D-9926 thanked SCP-6080 for saving him, 
and the two introduced themselves to one another. SCP-6080 offered to take D-9926 away from the Foundation forever. He took off his recording equipment, and the two walked away into the sunset. Inside SCP-6080's containment chamber, the object and D-9926 were nowhere to be found. Instead, there was a single disc containing a message from SCP-6080 to the Foundation. SCP-6080 told the Foundation that they were coming to terms with what they experienced in their life, and that now they were in a place where they could exist without issue. Behind them was a playground, where SCP-6080 could act like a kid again, something they never got to experience as much as they wanted to. They told the Foundation that D-9926 was safe and happy somewhere else and that they shouldn't look for either of them, because they'd never find them. For now, all SCP-6080 needed to do was to play on the swings and live at peace with themselves, until they could grow up. Inside the disc that the message was contained on was a sticky note that simply read, I hope you understand. Video games have come a long way over the years. We've gone from the days of Atari and Pong to virtual reality headsets, PS5s, and massive multiplayer online games where you can fight horror movie villains or wage war in a fantasy land. You can mine virtual minerals and avoid creepers in Minecraft, compete against people all over the world in Fortnite, and do whatever it is people do in Roblox. Games used to be a pixelated hero battling blobby monsters with no discernible facial features, and now they have graphics so detailed you can see the freckles on a protagonist's face and each individual blade of grass. But there's one thing that hasn't changed, no matter how much progress games may make. Whenever a shiny new console comes out, everyone wants to get their hands on it. It was Christmas season in 1986. Walk Like an Egyptian by the Bangles was at the top of the charts. Eddie Murphy's The Golden Child was the number one movie in America, and hundreds of thousands of kids were writing to Santa and begging their parents for one thing, the Nintendo Entertainment System. The NES was an 8-bit home video game console, and the only place to journey through the land of Hyrule in The Legend of Zelda, or help Samus hunt space pirates in Metroid. But with such an extreme demand for the system, stores were selling out all over the country. Anyone who didn't beat the crowds was doomed to disappoint their kids with socks, with less flashy toys like dolls or tiny plastic trucks, or with boring, non-electric, violence-free board games. Well, board games are only violence-free if you're not playing Monopoly. But back to 1986. Beverly Harrington was a single mom, doing her best to provide for her son, Jason, and give him the Christmas he deserved. She had been picking up extra shifts at the local diner, making sure to save up all the extra money for a real Christmas tree from the farm just out of town, for a beautiful honey-baked ham, and, of course, for presents. She knew that though he was a shy kid and would never demand it, Jason desperately wanted to find an NES under the tree on Christmas morning. She got so absorbed in her work, so exhausted from the extra shifts and trying to make everything perfect, that she forgot to do her actual shopping until the very last minute. She woke up the morning of December 24th with a start, her heart jumping into her throat. She hadn't picked up Jason's present yet. She threw on her coat and rushed out into the snowy streets, making her way to the store and saying a silent prayer that they would still have one more NES in stock. Lucky for her, they did. Less lucky, two parents were already wrestling for it, fighting each other with a raw, animalistic rage of two wolves competing for the same piece of meat. If she tried to grab it and join in, she could get hurt, or the console could break apart. She asked an employee if they had any in the back, but she already knew the answer from the exhausted look in his eyes. There were no more in the back. There were no more in town, nor the next town over, or the next town over from that. Not only would she have to get Jason's present at the very last minute, but she would also have to get him something he didn't even want. He would smile and thank her, but she knew how sad it would make him to go back to school and hear his friends bragging about their Christmases. She shoved her hands into the pockets of her coat and began her slow, sad march back through the snow, trying to come up with what to do next. Then something caught her eye, a brightly colored sign reading, Wondertaining Toys. Beneath it, it was a storefront she had never seen before, and right there in the window, a video game console. It wasn't the NES, not exactly, but it looked so much like it. She couldn't help herself. She had to go inside and get a better look. 
The store was filled with toys, games, and puzzles. They were all inviting, with vivid packaging and labels depicting children having fun, but she had never seen any of them before. Perhaps it was a new brand, and she was one of the first people to happen upon the store. It seemed odd for a toy store to open this close to Christmas, rather than taking advantage of the shopping season and opening earlier in the year. But she couldn't dwell on that, not when she was this close to a solution. Toward the back of the store, she spotted the video game console from the window. The label read, Pretendo. So the resemblance to the NES was no coincidence. This console was intended as a knockoff of some kind. She asked the sales clerk, a man with a strangely wide, unmoving smile, if the console was capable of running Nintendo games. You bet your bottom dollar, he replied. We don't carry those here, though. But can I interest you in some of our Wondertainment originals? We have all kinds of games here, and they're just as good or your money back. There's a whole world inside each and every one. It wasn't what she'd set out to buy, but this was clearly the best thing Beverly was going to find this close to the holiday. She paid the man for the Pretendo console and a selection of the store's most popular video games. He even gift-wrapped it for her in a colorful box with a shiny red bow on top. The next morning, Jason and Beverly sat in the living room, sipping cocoa and opening presents together. She started small with a classic pair of new wool socks and worked her way up to the big box in the corner. As Jason tore the paper off, his eyes lit up with glee. Thank you, Mom, thank you! He gave her a huge hug, then looked at her with nearly manic excitement. Can I play it now, can I? She laughed and promised that after he helped her clean up the wrapping paper, he could play his new games. She was just so glad he was happy with it. He didn't care that it wasn't the name brand console. He knew that this gift was special, so she was perfectly glad to let him enjoy it, and she could get started on that ham for later. Jason plugged in his brand new Pretendo and looked through the games his mom had picked out for him. There was Farmtastic Farming Simulator, Historical House Hunter, Magic Wizard Quest, Super Fighters, and one simply called Spooky. It was emblazoned with the image of a cartoon ghost in front of an abandoned cabin, and it piqued Jason's interest. He always loved scary stories and legends about ghosts and things that go bump in the night. He decided that this would be the first game that he would play. He placed the cartridge in the console and hit the power button to turn it on. As he clutched the controller in his hands, he began to notice something strange. His room, once decorated in posters of his favorite movies, turned dark. The light green walls became rotting wood. And for lack of a better way to describe it, the entire world's resolution began to shift. If the world around him had graphics, they were getting worse. He could no longer see the screen depicting the game's main menu, and in fact, the console itself had vanished. Somehow he was standing in the haunted cabin from the cover of the game. He looked down at his hands and found the controller still there. So, not everything had changed. Before he could think any more about this strange new place he found himself in, he heard the sound of ominous music seemingly coming from nowhere. After a moment, he realized why the sound of its melody filled him with dread. It was the kind of music that always played in a game when an enemy was getting close. He had to move. He took a step forward and moved through the space as if it was a real house. For the time being, it was. Somehow, he was inside the game, which meant the ghost was coming for him soon. He pressed a button on the controller to activate a flashlight and followed its beam through the darkened cabin. As he walked looking for clues or any object he could interact with, he could hear the music getting louder. Whatever was coming, it was getting closer. The flashlight's beam illuminated a scrap of paper on a small table. He moved to take a closer look and could just barely make out what it said. They hide in the darkness. Find the exit. Don't stop moving. He heard a sound behind him, and the music reached a deafening volume. He whirled around and saw nothing but the hall in front of him, bending around a corner. He knew from the heavy feeling in the pit of his stomach and the music that threatened to rupture his eardrums that there was something horrible waiting for him around that corner. He froze for a moment, then remembered the letter's words of warning. Don't stop moving. He took a step towards the corner, then another, and another. He shone the light of the flashlight around the corner, but there was nothing there. No ghost, no monster, nothing. And then he felt it. A chill on the back of his neck. He whirled around and there it was. The ghost of the cabin. It was so much bigger than it had looked before. Wispy white forms stretching up to the ceiling from wall to wall. 
its wide, dark eyes and gaping maw of a mouth inches from his own face. He screamed and instinctively swung the flashlight at the spirit, cutting through it with a beam of light. The ghost let out a shriek and shrank away from the glow. That was it. He just needed to keep the light on it, and the ghost couldn't hurt him. Jason was so thrilled by this little victory that he didn't even notice the boss music starting to play again, growing louder and louder. He didn't see the movement out of the corner of his eye, the silvery, pale figure of a woman stepping out of a portrait on the wall. All he felt was a sudden, overwhelming cold, like ice in his veins, and then everything went black. He opened his eyes back in his bedroom, looking at a dark screen with the words Game Over written in dripping red font. He couldn't tell for a moment if that had been real or a dream, but either way, he only wanted to do one thing, tell his mom. Beverly listened to her son's story and couldn't help but write it off as the overactive imagination of a child, but still she humored him and agreed to try the console for herself and see what happened. Choosing at random, she selected Farmtastic and pressed play. All of a sudden, she felt the heat of the sun on her face, heard the mooing of cows, and smelled fresh-cut hay. She was steering a tractor through a wide-open field, where a moment ago she had been standing in her house in the dead of winter. Jason shut off the game, pulling her back into reality, and as Beverly gasped in shock, Jason said, Best present ever. Unfortunately for Jason, word was already spreading about the Pretendo, all the way to the SCP Foundation. The console and all other consoles that the Foundation could track down were seized and designated SCP-591. SCP-591 is a line of video game consoles originally developed as a counterfeit of the Nintendo Entertainment System, before being bought and distributed by Dr. Wondertainment, a toy company responsible for a wide variety of anomalous objects contained by the Foundation over the years. The console is capable of playing NES titles, as well as games from Dr. Wondertainment's original lineup of 8-bit games, many of which the Foundation has in its possession as well. Some of the titles in the SCP Foundation's library include, but are not limited to, arcade shooter Wapham, platformer Dusky's Adventures in Stadeland, survival horror game You Can Do That on Television, puzzle game World War I Ace Trench Digger, music racing game Led Zeppelin Air Racers, fighting games Super Kick Karate and Super Kick Karate 2010, and the educational game Reading Rainbow Sit and Listen. Whenever one of the official Dr. Wondertainment cartridges is inserted into the console and activated, it results in a localized CK-class reality restructuring scenario, which rearranges reality in the immediate area to resemble the game's setting. The player inside of the game's affected radius will take on the role of the game's protagonist, and navigate the events of the game until either they win or the console is deactivated. Don't worry, this isn't one of those if you die in the game, you die in real life scenarios. If the player happens to be a less than adept gamer, they will simply respawn or start at the beginning of the game like any video game character would. That doesn't, however, mean that SCP-591 isn't dangerous. Like any piece of vintage technology, the components of the Pretendo system have degraded over time, their functionality steadily decreasing. For an ordinary game console, this would be a simple inconvenience, something that would impact the quality of the graphics or responsiveness of the controls. It would be annoying and maybe eventually unplayable, but otherwise harmless. For the Pretendo, however, this degradation has had catastrophic events. When a game cartridge is inserted into SCP-591, there is now a chance of the CK-class reality restructuring scenario going wrong, and resulting in a ZK-class reality failure scenario instead. Essentially, instead of just transporting the player into the world of the game, reality will crumble in the designated area and the laws of time, space, and physics will be bent or even broken. While the CK-class scenarios dissipate as soon as the console is deactivated, the ZK-class scenarios refuse to play by the rules. They remain in place wherever they first manifested, seemingly permanently. The ZK-class scenarios were first observed during playtesting by the research staff assigned to SCP-591. After learning about the nature of the Pretendo game system, Dr. Furukawa has volunteered as a test subject, specifically requesting that he be given the chance to play the Dr. Wondertainment title, The Legend of Swordmaster, because, quote, it just looks really cool. This particular game came with not just the cartridge, but a special sword-shaped controller, 
to be used during the sword fight sequences. Dr. Furukawa stepped into the containment cell where one instance of SCP-591 had been placed, with his chosen game cartridge and controller waiting for him. As soon as he inserted the cartridge into the console and pressed the start button, the room around him began to transform, reality itself warping and reshaping to fit the world of the game. Fluorescent lights and stark white walls were replaced by pixelated trees and a winding cobblestone path leading to a massive stone castle. The first enemy, a knight in black armor, leapt into frame, and Dr. Furukawa raised his sword ready for combat. But before he had a chance to deal the first blow, it became clear that something wasn't right. The enemy knight suddenly disappeared, glitching out of sight. The cobblestone slowly began to drift into the air, and so did Dr. Furukawa. Just as suddenly as he lifted off, he dropped back to the ground with a heavy thud. Gravity was rapidly fluctuating, and he could scarcely keep his balance. In front of him, he could see random cubic structures popping up out of nowhere, made of wood, stone, and ice. End the game! He called out desperately. Pull the plug, someone, please! Outside, one of the researchers watching the experiment cut the power to the console, but nothing happened. The world refused to return to normal. Security officers entered the area and attempted to remove Dr. Furukawa, but found that his body still resembled an 8-bit video game character. When they attempted to drag him out of the ZK-class zone, he cried out in pain as his body began to dissolve into static. They had turned off the console, but they were unable to pull him out. The rest of the research team, horrified by what they had witnessed, began to take measurements of the reality failure scenario from outside of the room. The area now displayed a complete absence of naturally occurring radiation, including cosmic background radiation. There was also evidence of time dilation, reduction of light speed, and the gravity fluctuations that Dr. Furukawa had first noticed. With no way to remove Furukawa from this broken reality, the area would have to be sealed off, and he would be left inside. There was no other option. So they constructed a concrete dome around the testing site and relocated the remaining instances of SCP-591. From that point on, testing was only conducted using D-classes, no matter how much research staff loved video games, or how vehemently they insisted that they were, quote, willing to roll the dice. They were barred from testing and encouraged to pick up a VR headset for a much lower risk immersive gaming experience. Over the years of testing following the Dr. Furukawa incident, four more ZK-class scenarios were created and contained. Some of the individuals survived the incident, but were physically altered so greatly that they would not be able to survive outside of the ZK-class reality failure. The only people who survived were unable to readjust to their lives, continuing to live as the main character of the game that they were playing. At this point, testing was officially suspended indefinitely due to not only the loss of human life, but also the unpredictable and highly dangerous nature of the damage being done to reality on such a grand scale. All instances of SCP-591 confiscated by the Foundation are kept in a storage containment vault, kept separate from any civilians or their infrastructure by a distance of at least 500 meters. It is also kept separate from other Foundation-controlled containment facilities. Unless it is being used for official, approved testing by Level 3 staff, it is to remain deactivated at all times. Any ZK-class scenarios created by an instance of SCP-591 will be contained via the construction of a closed concrete dome and given the designation of Sector W number. Sectors W1 through W5, the currently existing ZK-class scenarios, are monitored remotely and kept highly classified. Any personnel or test subjects located inside one of these sectors will remain there indefinitely and be officially considered lost in action. Any additional instances of SCP-591 located in civilian stores, households, or any public place are to be removed and contained indefinitely. As the years have gone by, testing has indicated a steady increase in the rate of ZK-class scenarios being generated from a CK-class scenario. Where it was only a 1% chance, there is now a 32% chance. According to Wondertainment Company records seized during a Foundation raid of one of their toy factories, there are still plenty of SCP-591 instances out there in the world, just waiting for some unsuspecting gamer to fire them up and get lost in the story, literally. If the documents found are accurate, there are around 243 consoles and 1,300 consoles still in circulation. These also may or may not include a Pocket Pretendo model that was developed as a prototype but never officially released on the market. 
If it was, and the chaos of the Pretendo system is available in a portable form, well, it's best not to think about that for too long. The Foundation is doing its best to track down the remaining Pretendo systems, but there is no way to know for sure what distant corners of the world they've made their way to. So when you're picking up a shiny new game console, or a nostalgic vintage model to relive some of your favorite childhood memories with, take an extra close look at the label and make sure you're getting the real thing. Because if you're not careful, it just might be game over. Modern cognitive neuroscience tells us that our memories are about as reliable as a weatherman at your local news channel. When a couple is asked, how did you first meet? They are lured into romanticized reflection. They might recall locking eyes at a school dance. They might recall the night being just perfect, despite the truth being far from it. We don't remember the spilled punch, the stepped on toes, or the st 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 stuttering. We only remember the X's and O's. Our memory doesn't find the needle by sifting through the haystack but rather by lighting a match and setting the barn ablaze, until all that remains is the small piece of silver shining through the smoke. In this way, our memories are our best friends. They know exactly when to lie to us, feeding us misinformation about the past to satisfy ourselves in the present. Because if humans were capable of writing and recalling accurate personal accounts of their history, our memories would be stiff, unmarketable literature. And when a book gets boring, we tend to tap out. Just the same when our lives get monotonous, we tend to give up. So we have our faulty, biased brains to thank us for our perceived happiness and fulfillment. Our inaccurate memory systems consequently help us hide trauma, contrive purpose, and infuse unique importance into an otherwise banal existence. But let it be known, not all cerebral restructurings are gifts from psychology. Some are curses from SCPs. Which of these two possibilities is more existentially terrifying is up to you. SCP-5040 is a non-existent Japanese horror film entitled Tears of Blood, which spontaneously manifests in human memories. SCP-5040 is a master of persuasion. Those affected by SCP-5040 will remember going to see the film even when their supposed attendance would contradict empirical evidence. It manipulates the mind into unwavering faith. While humans occasionally stumble upon the self-awareness to question their recollection, there are no documented instances of an individual doubting this specific memory. Somehow, beyond the Foundation's understanding, SCP-5040 manages to suspend the skepticism of its victims. They accept the memory as canon, as brute fact. Victims of SCP-5040 do not need a ticket stub to know they have been to the theater, and SCP-5040 afflictions can occur any place where movies are shown. It even transcends laws and navigates social norms. In cultures where its content would usually be prohibited by regulations and frowned upon by the public, it still inserts itself into the memory of its prey, and once that memory is planted, it's an event that can't be forgotten. Like the birth of your first child. Like your favorite football team winning the Super Bowl. Like the employee number you punch in and out of work every day for the rest of your life. It stamps itself into the forefront of the subject's brain, waving its arm, pleading to be recognized, begging for attention. Descriptions of the film are always similar in nature, as are the circumstances and events surrounding the viewing. However, reports of SCP-5040's story and characters are never fully consistent from one subject to the next, and the film's setting, subplots, character names, and much of the dialogue are different for each viewer. Whether this is SCP-5040's intent or inadequacy is unclear. Casting also varies and appears largely arbitrary. A broad variety of Japanese performers and entertainment personalities, both living and deceased, have been said to star in the film, even when the actor in question has no real-life associations with the horror genre. Imagine famous Japanese actor Pat Morita, better known as Mr. Miyagi from The Karate Kid, being the lead in a horror film. Despite the fact this would be a noticeably strange casting decision, SCP-5040 would still be taken seriously. Despite any and all deviations from expectations of the medium, SCP-5040 is seen as legitimate, 
Kinks in its design are overlooked by the viewer, similar to how our sleeping selves most often don't recognize we are dreaming, even when we encounter flying horses, friends with banana fingers, and leprechauns playing Pot Limit Omaha in Chris Hemsworth's basement. This may be because, despite all of its quirks, the film's core is sturdy. Its beginning, middle, and end are always in agreement. It doesn't stray from Robert McKee's universal structure of story. Not even the sick, twisted M. Night Shyamalan himself could have created a cinematic experience quite like this. After conducting more than 300 interviews, researchers have constructed a detailed synopsis of SCP-5040's most consistent story elements and the most common sequence of events associated with the viewer's memory of their screening attendance. There is no matinee with this movie. Screenings always begin at sunset. If there are obstacles standing in the way of the subject's attendance, SCP-5040 will see them removed. Dentist appointments, drinks with a friend, a long procrastinated date with the treadmill. All these commitments for that day and time will be pushed down the subject's list of priorities, making way for the movie. They will learn that their plans have been canceled or resolved one way or another. The dentist's office burned to the ground. Your friend is suddenly sober. The model of treadmills at your gym have been recalled. Somehow, some way, time is freed up. And when life is kind enough to offer respite from personal and social obligations, it is modern human's instinct to sit down and veg out. At this moment, the subjects decide to see a movie at a nearby theater. Upon arrival, the theater looks to be an entity in its own right. Long lines of patrons are like limbs extending from its center box office. Bright, blocky letters forming the film's title run across the marquee like a cheap tattoo. It is truly madness. A frenzied crowd gathers at the box office, pushing and shoving, clawing at the glass partition for a ticket. The entire theater has been reserved for this special event, a one-time-only screening of a rare, critically acclaimed film. Admission is entirely free. But is it actually free? Or has the cost just not declared itself? When the subject reaches the auditorium, they scan their eyes over the sea of people. Heads emerge from the backs of almost every seat. They can only find one empty space, and they have to shuffle like a crab to get past the mass of other viewers. In their seat, they notice that a large number of people throughout the audience are wearing disposable face masks. The woman sitting next to the subject's right wears one such mask, as does the woman on their left. And before you think, well, that isn't so weird, it's important to note that all of these accounts were taken years before certain recent events. Patrons continue to pack into the theater. Despite every chair being filled, more and more people enter. The aisles become overflow seating. Regulations of max occupancy are dismissed. In the darkness of the room, all that can be clearly seen are shapes. The rectangle that is the screen, the hundreds of circles that are the heads of the audience, but there is a shape that feels misplaced. What appears to be the letter P sticks up from the crowd, a thin line with a bulge protruding from the top. The specificity of its origin is difficult to define, but once the subject's eyes adjust to the dark, they notice it's an IV pole carrying a bag of unknown fluid. However, there is no clear indication of who it is connected to. Furthermore, they notice one of the masked audience members is wearing a hospital gown. There is little time to assess any of these strange visuals, because there are no trailers or advertisements before the film. As soon as the audience is settled into whatever space they might find temporarily habitable, the theater goes silent and the film begins. The film opens with the female protagonist going about mundane activities in her day-to-day -day life. A phone call interrupts her. It is an unknown party who tells her that a loved one has been hospitalized for one reason or another. The protagonist drops what she's doing to accept the call to action. On her way to the hospital, however, she is attacked by a male assailant and loses consciousness. The protagonist wakes up in a fog, unable to make sense of her surroundings, but the audience understands that wherever she is, she is in deep trouble. She's in a desolate and unfamiliar building with her arms and legs bound. She is accompanied by a number of other female captives, some of whom still remain seemingly unconscious or possibly dead. The women briefly discuss their strategy to escape, but they are interrupted when the kidnapper appears. Descriptions of hairstyle, eye color, and wardrobe would fall short in showing us who this character really is. 
Instead, his swift and decisive actions do the talking. He sees one of the women crying and kills her without hesitation. The kidnapper reveals to the woman the code he intended to operate under. He would release the captives after 24 hours, but only under the condition that they do not cry. During the film, the kidnapper demonstrates various forms of physical and psychological torture on the group of women. Despite their best efforts, the captives are unable to hold back their tears, and one by one, they are murdered until only the protagonist remains. Frustrated by the protagonist's unremarkable resolve, the kidnapper takes more extreme measures, increasing the intensity of her torture. However, the protagonist is not one to be messed with. Despite being tormented, she seems in control of the situation. She doesn't succumb to the traditional dynamics of torture. Even while on the wrong end of the bat, she isn't afraid to swing. She fights back how she can. She mocks and insults her captor, and it's then she finds his weakness. Although a physically empowering villain, he is emotionally fragile. Her grit frustrates him, causing him to lose focus and become noticeably rattled. As the protagonist continues to weaken her kidnapper with words, the subject in the audience notices what seems to be a slight echo in the dialogue. They look up to see if something is wrong with the speakers. They even wonder if this is a stylistic decision made by the director. But then they notice where it is coming from. They eventually realize that the two masked women sitting beside them are quietly repeating every line of dialogue as it occurs. Their lips moving causes their masks to shake softly. With each word, the air from their whispers blows the cloth away from their mouth, only for the mask to collapse back in when the syllable is completed. If the subject looks even closer, they will see that the lower half of the women's masks are saturated with saliva. Things don't get any more pleasant when the subject shifts their gaze down the woman's body. Just near their waists, their hands are clasped together so tightly that their fingernails are digging into their skin. They tremble and fidget, as if having taken on the burden of the world's anxiety, and no medication can calm them down. Fingernails dig deeper into their skin, drawing blood and foreshadowing the film's finale. At the film's climax, the kidnapper approaches the protagonist with a double-edged razor blade, and announces that even if she is freed, she will spend the rest of her life horribly disfigured. This leads to an argument between the two the subtext of which alludes to themes such as nature of inner and outer beauty, the value of women in society, and the societal stigma against expressions of vulnerability. The argument on the surface, however, does not sound sophisticated or profound. There is no consolation for a fight having emotional depths. At the end of the day, the blows will always feel more physical than intellectual. Eventually, the kidnapper loses patience and grabs the protagonist by the shoulders and slams her to the floor. He reaches out his hands and grabs her by the face. The subject's attention is again pulled from the screen when they hear groaning from every direction. The wordless hums fill the theater with a sense of worry and uneasiness. So much so that the subject feels the room getting smaller as the air polluted with angst grows thicker. As the subject brings their eyes back to the film, they see the kidnapper gripping the protagonist's lower lip between his thumb and forefinger, squeezing tight as to pop her lip like a balloon. The kidnapper then takes the razor blade to the victim's lips. He pauses to mock the protagonist, and while he does this, blinded by pride and arrogance, she jolts into action, grabbing the razor right out of his hands with her teeth. She follows up her burglary with assault. Her neck stabs forward, and in a blur, she stabs the kidnapper's eyes out. It happens in an instant. The kidnapper has no time to react. Blood spills from his face. Screams pour out of his mouth. During this time, the protagonist maneuvers the razor into her fingers. She hacks away at her bindings, but they are stubborn and resist her sawing. The battle continues, and the kidnapper is able to tear off the victim's lips entirely. She looks like a monster now. As the kidnapper smiles and celebrates his wrongdoings, the protagonist finishes freeing herself and slits the kidnapper's throat with the razor. The protagonist locates the exit and scrambles towards it as the kidnapper bleeds to death on the cold, hard floor. The protagonist then speaks her final words. Due to her injuries, her voice is muffled and raspy. She bears down and calmly speaks. One last time, she mocks the kidnapper, telling him that he cried tears of blood and therefore had to die according to his own rules. During this climax, it is reported that the subjects experience a sense of dread unique to any other terror ever felt. Strangely, the feeling appeared not to correspond to the scene in the film at all. It is a feeling entirely separate from the viewing experience, as if for a moment, 
the subject is taken out of the moment in time and transported to a realm composed only of fear and anxiety. But just as quickly as they left, they return. The Foundation sees it worth mentioning that this peculiar moment happens to occur during the film's most clearly recalled scene. While descriptions of violence vary from one viewer to the next, the climax is unshakable in its consistency. This is further evidence that SCP-5040 has a core foundation that remains intact. False memories are given validity by our peers. When we tell a story, the inaccuracies are often the best parts, the exaggerated drama, the rearranged sequence of events, the jokes you thought of in retrospect, but weaved into later accounts. While a storyteller knows when to lie, a good storyteller knows how to not get caught. SCP-5040 captivates its audience, but it seems to know how much it can get away with. By providing a consistent, objective truth, a climax that is reported the same across all accounts, SCP-5040 insists, even if only briefly, on being a credible film, not just a random sequence of 24 frames per second. Eyes back to the screen, the film abruptly cuts to an unspecified point in the future. Now wearing a face mask to hide her disfigured mouth, no different than the one seen worn in the theater, the protagonist walks down the street to her apartment, indifferent to the crowd of paparazzi that follows her. It is clear that this is now just a part of her life. The lights flash on her face. When she reaches her bedroom, the protagonist slowly pulls down her mask. Face free from cloth, she stares at herself in the mirror. It is silent. What she sees is less notable than what she doesn't. The lower portion of her face is gone. She focuses only on that. It's hard to know if she will ever see into her own eyes again. Her gaze might forever be fixed on what she can't get back. And through those eyes that long to see more, she sheds a single tear. Over the course of several minutes, her weeping gradually builds into frenzied sobs and shrieks. It can first be misinterpreted as bad acting, a case of doing too much. But as the crying carries onward, it's understood that the horror in her wallowing is all too real. The film cuts to black and the credits roll, but the sound of the protagonist's cries continue to play with no other audio until the credit reel ends. And even then, in silence, it's hard to say if she ever stopped crying. Audience members remain silent after the movie ends, exchanging only whispers as they exit the theater. Feet step over small red puddles and stains on the theater floor as if they are sticky puddles of soda. Those who remain past this point experience an escalating feeling of unwelcomeness until sitting and staying is more physically demanding than getting up and walking out. Some experiences will stay with you forever, even if they never actually happened. Now go check out SCP-592 Inaccurate History Book and SCP-2030 Laugh is Fun for more media that'll stick in your brain forever.